I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, this is the Thursday, November 21st meeting, regular uh, meeting of the school committee uh, at 7.02 p.m. I request all those present and willing to join, please do so in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. for recognitions. Do we have any recognitions? Hmm? Okay. Uh, we'll move on to public comment. This is the time for public uh, to come forward and make any comment. We have some audience members, which is great. Hello, Mr. Manning. All right. Seeing none, we'll move on um, straight into reports today. We uh, would like to change the order a little bit. We'll start with the special education budget presentation by Dr. Zaleski and uh, Ms. Debao is here as well to support. All set? Okay, good evening. I've, my budget is up here. I'm presenting my executive summary tonight for the FY21 special education budget for the district. And I'll start with just the uh, preliminary overview. So right now my budget is at a preliminary number of 11,923,923, which re reflects an increase of 908,755 from the FY20 budget, which essentially works out to be an increase of 8.3%. Primarily, this is an increase in salaries and expenses, which I'll explain in detail in a few minutes. So in terms of the salary increases, the personnel summary um, the number includes positions that were already added in FY20, so the adjustments from FY20 to 21 are displayed here tonight, um, and then requested new positions in addition to the contractual obligations of step, lane, and negotiated increases. So the cost of positions total requested is 262724 to meet the student needs in the department. So if you look between the FY20 and 21 adjustments, we added uh, five new paraprofessional positions at uh, varying levels to support the student needs as we came to know the students in the service delivery, as well as to support student move-ins that were unanticipated throughout the year. The new positions that we're requesting, and I have Mr. Bo with us, um, that's going to give us a little more detail about the pre-K teaching position. But we are asking to add a new pre-K classroom to the Marathon Elementary School. Um, primarily the reason for that is we have a significant anticipated enrollment coming in from EI. So EI stands for early intervention for those of you watching that may not be familiar with that. And part of the assessment that we do when we're making this type of determination is we look at the number of students that we have that are potentially going to qualify for services and we make our project in, projection based on that analysis. And so based on that analysis, Mr. Bo and I have determined that to function effectively next year, we do need a pre-K classroom. Um, in an effort to support that pre-K classroom, we have an integrated model at the preschool. And um, what that means is uh, students are, are integrated with typical as well as intensive special needs students. And we support them with paraprofessional support both ABA support to support the students with the intensive needs as well as general paraprofessional support. Um, so what that looks like is you have an instructor with the two paraprofessionals supporting the students so they can have the best opportunity to learn in, in an environment that fosters the most independence at that grade level um, with supports because of the age range as well because they're young and we want to make sure that they get all the services that they need. So, Mr. Bo, I don't know if you want to speak a little bit more about that before I move on, because I think that's really important while we're just talking about what that's going to look like in the building for next year. So, I have not needed to come before school committee to speak about preschool for a number of years, and I'm not sure if it's three or four years. At that time, we had revised our preschool program so that we could provide more special education slots, if you will, more opportunities, as well as increase community peer partners, as well as set our staffing up so our staffing was such that it would support that rolling enrollment throughout the year. In years prior, as new students came to the preschool, we were needing to add staff. We had worked with a consultant, we looked at our model, um, and we made those changes so that our program 
was able to absorb the growth. Preschool, unlike any other grade in the district, it's approximately 50% special needs and it's rolling in mission. When children turn three, they're ours. They're Early intervention provides their support, birth to three, and once children are three, the public school then takes over um, that um, instructional educational piece. So throughout the year, our numbers grow. We anticipate that. Something that you've heard well from Dr. Kavanaugh is our enrollment story and growth that has hit preschool. We Half of our special education enrollments over the summer were at preschool this summer. We started off this fall with more special education slots filled than we have in the past. We have few openings and we know children coming when they turn three. Um, we have ratios to abide by in preschool and if we cannot provide their supports here, we need to look elsewhere, and we don't want to send our preschoolers somewhere else for preschool. So adding an additional preschool class would allow us to, as our district grows, grow our preschool and provide their educational supports within our public schools. So in addition to adding the preschool classroom, um, I am looking to add additional paraprofessional support in, uh, in different grade levels. So I'm looking to add in intensive special needs paraprofessional at the Elmwood School to support an anticipated student coming in um, at that level, as well as we have an existing paraprofessional that serves as a, a special education paraprofessional in the moderate environment. We're looking to shift that person to an intensive special needs paraprofessional. Um, to support students in the intensive environment. As, and we did that based on numbers. We analyzed caseloads. We looked at the profiles of the students. We looked at their service delivery grids. This is really how we make those determinations as to whether or not you need a general paraprofessional support in the, inc in the inclusive environment in the classroom versus intensive support because you might need additional support, whether it's with instruction or behavior or emotional regulation. We also, um, I'm also looking to add uh, a special education paraprofessional at Hopkins in the general environment to support instruction because um, that's a definite need. Right now we're doing a very good job, but looking at the numbers for next year, projected Elmwood coming into Hopkin, Hopkins, um, we really want to level the playing field across the teams at Hopkins and make sure we have enough support for the students on those teams. Um, and also we anticipate a student um, coming up from the middle school is going to need some um, intensive special needs support with paraprofessional assistance. Typically at the high school level, we don't need um, this type of support often. And so really this year, and looking at the numbers and all of the work that we're doing in our life skills program in conjunction with their 18 to 22 program, to make this work effectively so that the students are receiving the functional living skills and the instruction that they need in those programs, we need this level of support because they're functioning at different levels and um, they're doing quite well, but we want to keep it that way. So we're going to ask for that support. The 0.5 psychologist at Marathon, so if I can just explain that a little bit. Right now we have um, a 0.5 psychologist going to Marathon to provide assessments and intervention. We also have a 0.2 psychologist coming from the high school, so it's a 1.0 position, coming down to support the pre-K. What's, what's troubling about that is the number of evaluations and assessments that we're doing due to the increased enrollment, um, and as well as the student needs and parent requests for evaluation. It's causing great difficulty because our high school um, psychologist is having to leave the high school and go down to the preschool to do these assessments. And when I met with the high school staff, as well as Mr. Bishop, to ask you know, what they need to stabilize their building for next year, um, hands down, all of them asked me to please keep related service providers in their building um, because what happens is they'll conduct, our psychologist will conduct the assessments, but is often called upon to be a, an expert at the team meetings and the person's not available because they're at the pre-K. And it's really difficult because then they have to plan around when the person's going to be in the building. So in looking at the number of evaluations that we're going to have at the pre-K through one level, um, because of all the students coming in, combined with the high school, it's pretty astronomical. We have upwards of 80 students being evaluated at both levels. And um, so by putting in the 0.5, that allows me to have a 1.0 position at Marathon and a 1.0 position at the high school, and just it levels it so that nobody's leaving the buildings and the building can be supported. Um, and what's nice about that in Lauren's building is... Not, when they're not testing, there's an opportunity for them to provide crisis intervention service and support. Um, 
and right now, because we are sharing positions across the district, oftentimes other folks are called in who might not necessarily be familiar with the student or the family, and that can be tricky. Parents might have questions about, you know, a precipitant to a behavior or, um, you know, what's been happening ongoing with the student in the, in the classroom, and the provider that might be stepping in to help, because that's the person on site, isn't as knowledgeable as a person who would be consistently there providing support. So... We feel that this is really in the best interest of the students and the social-emotional health of our district, as well as keeping us in compliance and special education with the testing requirements, because we never want to be fa fall behind on timelines. And we haven't so far. We've done pretty well, but we want to keep it that way. Um, additionally, I'm asking for secretarial support. Last year, I asked for secretarial support in other buildings. This year, again, with the growing needs of enrollments, um, our secretaries at both the high school and the Hopkins level Oftentimes throughout the year, last year and over the summer, I would have to pay them extra out of my 240 grant just because the the overwhelming um, amount of work that's required to make sure they're meeting the timelines, comp compiling records for me if I have record requests for providers, um, they and and all the filing that goes along with it to ensure that we're meeting the timelines and packets are going out to different placements. I'm finding that they're doing work after hours and in the summertime. And what's tricky is every year it's I, it's a balancing act with me where I look at our 240 grant and I I, I worry about how we can have enough funds to support secretar secretaries to do some some work in the summer because they get behind during the year with some of these requirements. So to eliminate all of that, if I'm able to increase their time here in the district during the day, not that this will be completely eliminated, I'll probably still need some help in the summer, but it, it's going to level the playing field so we can get the job done and they're, they're focused. So um, that's a point three increase in total for secretarial support. So ultimately, the pre-K position, as Lauren spoke about, is going to support our potential incoming EI projections and be able to allow us to provide services to those students the um, the paraprofessional supports gives us the opportunity to provide in classroom support to the teaching staff as well as to um, the building administration and to the related service providers to offer oh, social emotional support um, to those students above and beyond who might need assistance um, escorting through the halls or in classrooms or other settings that's what's nice about the paraprofessional positions we have that flexibility to have staff go to and from places with them if they need that level of assistance and then again the psychologists to stabilize and level the playing field and then for student support service delivery with the um, secretarial support so just as a, a summary of my expense summary in, in general, apart from the staffing requests, I'm asking for an increase of about $158,000 in expenses. And the more significant expenses are related directly to uh, transportation needs as we're transporting students to and from programs. One of the things that we're doing more of, which I think is really in the best interest of students, is we have students in some programs who are requesting um, to stay after school for activities because we really want them to be able to develop some friendships and to really develop some skills and, and be part of the life of the school that they're going to. And so we've been requested to you know provide additional transportation maybe after hours beyond the program, which is a cost impact. But um, it's just so good for the kids, and it's really worked out well for us. So we we want to continue to be able to do that on top of the transportation requests we have and we're obligated to provide. So that's above and beyond. We're also providing transportation to students that are homeless in the district. Um, so that's another expense. And then um, we also have to put monitors on the vans sometimes. So if a student's having difficulty, we might need to put a monitor for support and safety for the students and for the staff. So that's that's an additional expense and um, the foster care and the homeless transportation. In the area of contracted services, uh, I've increased that to about $35,000. And what that is is to address um, specific contracts. So we have contracts with Learning Center for the Deaf to provide um, orientation and mobility to students with visual needs, communication needs and assessments. All of those we do through outside providers and vendors, which requ require a contracted uh, service provider to do that, um, as well as if we have students in placement that have specific reading needs, we might have tutoring that we're contracting with. So we want to keep that going. Um, I've also added this year 
some funds into contract service for CPAC workshops. So we're working to expand and do some things in CPAC to provide offerings and presentations and that there is a cost impact with that. We are trying to fundraise with CPAC, but um, in my collaboration with CPAC through the budget process, we have um, decided that it's really best to have a safety net in the budget because the 240 grant is is fluid and it's unpredictable. So far, it's been working quite well for us. In the past couple of years, we've had a slight e increase, but every year we always get the memo that there's a threat that we might not get as much and what's going to happen. And it's very worrisome for, t for me as a director when I get those types of alert emails because primarily we have to prioritize salaries, stipends, transportation, those things. So these other things are like luxury items. They could be luxury items that I might not be able to afford. So to avoid the potential impact of that happening, we're going to budget for that for now. And in the future, it's my hope that as we fundraise and we're able to add to the CPAC gift account, we wouldn't have to necessarily budget that way. But to get us off the ground and launched and successful, I want to be able to have that those funds in the budget. And... I also put $5,000 in ESY contracted services. So we have um, a lot of work that we're doing on our ESY committee, and we've had some suggestion. Um, Ms. Tyler was actually part of that in terms of looking at different programming for potential summer activities for students for social opportunities. And I don't want money to interfere with our decision making. So I want to be able to have some extra funds in the budget to allow us the flexibility to build additional activities and supports for students in the summer. And that 5000 can go to anything ranging from paying for a program for students to attend. Like last year, we did the Y, and we paid a certain fee so students could go, and they enhanced their skills. They Some of them swam. They got to connect with other peers um, and had a lot of great opportunities. We also uh, need to think about transportation in that cost. So I, again, I just didn't want money to hinder our opportunity to further advance what we're trying to do. So I'm budgeting for that as well. I also doubled the 240 grant um, for, for other activities. Last year we did kids in sports and we had some providers coming in and we want to offer that to more than just a select population. So we want to offer it to the grade different grade spans. And again, to do that, there's a cost impact. So in addition to this, I've doubled some funds in the 240 grant, which I already wrote last summer, which will spill into this summer. I added into the budget $10,000 for special education evaluations and risk assessments. So throughout the year, we may have students that have some social emotional needs that need an assessment above and beyond what our district can offer for the standard assessment. And what's nice about having this money in the budget is it's really tricky for parents when students have a specific need and the wait lists are incredible for support and evaluations. Oftentimes parents can't find a provider. The student might be in crisis, a family might need an immediate assessment, and they'll call our office. And I work with the principal leadership team as well as the counseling staff across the district. Um, but it's very nice to have this, this you know, budget for these, this type of assessment because I'm able to say to families in that situation, no problem. I have a relationship with some vendors across the different programming. We can set up an assessment for your child. The child can come in. We can conduct the full psychosocial assessment. We can make recommendations. The other part that's really nice about it is parents will get some immediate recommendations. We as a school district will have some guidance in terms of implementing those recommendations. And oftentimes it prevents an out-of-district placement. It prevents us from having to put students in a 45-day placement to receive this type of assessment. So um, it's really a win-win. Students get supported. Families don't have the inconvenience of having to find providers and waiting long periods of time when they're so worried. And we also are able to keep kids in district when we need to do this type of assessment. Um, for supplies, we are um, asking for an increase of twelve thousand um, dollars. This is going to consist of furniture. With the new pre-K classroom, we do have to furnish the pre-K classroom. Um, Two thousand dollars for CPAC supplies. So as we do activities through CPAC, we want to be able to have a little bit of funds if we want to have families, you know, have some pizza with us or you know be be you know involved in in something that might be a little bit. Uh, costly. Like we had an ice cream social this summer and we, we were um, kind enough to have some donations from the Friends of CPAC for that. We want to be able to, um, you know, have funds for things like that as well. Um, 
and to be able to offer that to families without worrying about the, the money aspect. Also, um, high school furniture, to, uh, Mr. Donahue has asked me in partnership with Mr. Bishop for $2,000 for some student desks. There's a need for some student stand-up desks at the high school. So the high school hasn't asked for a lot in terms of supplies over the over the years, so we did agree to that. And then the $3,000 to support the 18-22 to 22 program. So the 18-22 to 22 program, as you know, has moved into a new location. Very excited about that. They're doing quite well. We're going to be having an open house soon. You'll be getting a flyer about that momentarily. And um, part of the work that I've agreed to do with the 18-22 um, to 22 program in partnership with Dr. Kavanaugh and um, Susan Rothamick, Tim Pearson, as well as we're going to formulate a committee eventually. We're going to create a program vision, and with that program vision, we're hoping to work with the students to engage in some kind of a business endeavor so they can really put to work some of the great skills that they have and to help them um, put into action some post-secondary skills to prepare them for their future beyond the 18 to 22 program. I don't know what that's going to be, and I don't know what that's going to look like. And like I said, we will be working to formulate a committee to discuss that further. But I want to have the funds to get us started to potentially launch something like that. So if anyone has any great ideas, I'm so open to that. I really am. I think this is going to be exciting work. And then finally, uh, the tuition. So we're pleased to report that the budget this year has a slight decrease in the uh, tuition amounts for our added districts. So... The out-of-district budget is always uh, fluid. Students move in. Sometimes they move in their emplacements. They move out. We've been able to work. We, when I say we, myself and Ms. Shagnon, our out-of-district coordinator, have uh, really done a good job of analyzing student needs and bringing student back, students back where appropriate. When I looked at the numbers more closely, um, within this past year, we were able to bring back five students. Five students also went out. A couple of them moved in and they were in placements. And a couple of them we actually put out. But what's nice about that is students that were out were able to come back that had been out. And we worked with the families to develop action plans. So, you know, just to help folks understand, when students go out of district, they're still part of our district. They belong to us. They're not just out, out there. We connect with them. We check on the programs. We work with the clinical staff. Ms. Shagnan and I tag team. We go to different meetings in the out-of-district placements. We talk with folks. And um, if students express an interest in wanting to return and, or families want the students to return, we work, we strive to, to allow them to do so. And other times, they're very successful in the placement, and they want to stay, and they're comfortable, and so we will allow for that as well. But anyway, so we've been able to pretty much level the playing field with that to balance students moving in in placements versus students wanting to return. Um, so we've got a slight decrease of $3,613 at this current time. So I'm happy to answer questions. Questions? I have a, a comments. Sure. Um, I think you've done a really wonderful job Thank at you. trying to bring the costs down Thank you. and to contain a budget. I think it's worth mentioning, if I have my statistics correctly, um, that there are 481-ish SPED students in the district. So that makes up more than 12% of our student population, and I think that's important to keep in mind when we're looking at these large numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm amazed you were <laughs> able to increase the budget so little. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about the, the choice of hiring more paraprofessionals rather than full-time learning specialists and why that choice was made? Sure. So the paraprofessionals, so depending upon how the IEP reads. So with the ABA paraprofessionals, ABA typically means one-to-one -one support. So for that specific purpose, we wouldn't hire teaching staff because the student needs one-to-one -one support in all settings. Typically, it's for, for safety and for regulation. So that would be the reason for that, that decision. Um, as far as the uh, special education para support, there's two of them, which is at the pre-K level to support our model. So again, we we are supporting a teacher as well in conjunction with the para support. And so I would say the only outlier in, in this and not having a teaching staff specifically is the special education paraprofessional at Hopkins to level the playing field on the team. Now with that, in my, which is not in the executive summary, but I know you folks have it in your packet, 
in my form two, um, what we are doing is we're restructuring in the district to provide an in, in, increase in some teaching staff to level the playing field. So for instance, we are taking a moderate learning specialist from the middle school and we're reallocating service delivery to the two elementaries at Elmwood and Marathon. To your point, Meg, is to be able to allow increased teaching support because we do see the value of that. 100% we see the value of that. As we are looking at data and we're analyzing student IEP service grids, we're looking at caseloads, principals met all together with Dr. Kavanaugh. We did a deeper dive analysis and as a district we agreed that um, although we're not asking for specific increases to impact the budget, we absolutely are going to engage in some restructuring efforts to support student needs with teaching staff. Thank you. You're welcome. Questions? I have one. Um, the pre-K pre classrooms, I guess I got, I actually have two. <laughs> um, so um, with the increase in the early intervention, has that affected the number of, um, it's an inclusion classroom basically, right? So has it affected the number of general education students that have been admitted into the preschool as a result of the increase in the early intervention students? Um, so we have we ha it has not impacted our ability to have community peers or tuition-based students in. So we currently have um, four classrooms, but we have six programs, if you will. We have two teachers who teach morning and afternoon sessions, so they might have a total of 30 students. Those are the more moderate needs students. We have two teachers who are intensive-based preschool teachers and those children attend a full day program with community peers for half of the day. So everyone has integration and that was very important to us. Okay. Um, and it has, we've seen a greater transition to kindergarten when they've had centers and calendar and um, snack and worked with peers. Um, so what we're seeing is our shifts from early intervention are more intensive based. So where we have two classrooms and we have X number of slots for our special education peers, we're running out of slots, if you will, as we know who's turning three in March and April and who moved in over the summer. Um, so it, it, with the additional classroom, we will be able to add more community peers as well because we always balance it out. It's not just special education students. Everyone has inclusion um, in preschool. Okay. And there's, this is logistical, but there's a classroom well, for these preschool students. Someone has to travel already in Marathon. Someone's so traveling. every every room is booked. There okay. is no empty space. And next year, some of our programs will have to travel. I know. Two years in. <laughs> yep. So I also, well, do you, do you want to do kindergarten preschool? You have something separate? I don't want to, like, I cut you off. I a quick one on the preschool, but I... Go ahead then, because the, then I'm moving on. If you're increasing the number of community peers in the program, that would there would be an offset, I would think, with the tuition. Somewhere we would have some it. tuition. And something we added to our lottery, which the application is now open, that um, and we do the lottery in February, but already we have inquiries quite early in the fall that um, you have approximately a month from the time that you were in the lottery to s submit your deposit, and it's non-refundable. So <laughs> that we're looking to get that and hold on to it. It's motivation. <laughs> it is motivation. Yep, you're in. Correct. So we'll have some more um, lottery funds coming in. You're correct. Not enough to offset all no, of that. But, but. <laughs> but I did want to also point out that you're, the, as you spoke, Karen, about the psychology position, psychologist position, um, and having to bounce back and forth between... Yep the littles, you know, yep. these, you know, ki kindergarten kids, and then she has to, or he has to completely switch yep. mindsets and come up to the high school. So I think that kind of, to me, kind of underscores the sort of hidden pressure that the faculty and staff are dealing with as a result of, like, I know you talk about it a lot, Amanda, we, they have to, you know, someone had to get in their car, stop thinking 16-year-old, start thinking 6-year-old, drive across the street, sit down with a little... So that's such a, a piece that I think a lot of folks might not realize is even happening. So to have someone who can focus their efforts on the high school students and then another person who can focus their efforts on the, the kindergarten and the, um, the littles, it may, I think it's going to make a huge difference to just their own well-being at work on top of the kids having a better, you know, better access to the... the services that they need. 
And I appreciate you saying that because that is the the hidden pressure that nobody sees right. and that what we've worked to do. And um, what Mr. Bo's been great about doing is working with the other staff at the building, the school adjustment counseling and the counseling staff to try and supplement that. But again, that there's a pressure in that too mm-hmm. because people are picking up the pieces and trying to stop what they're doing and trying to figure out their day to make it work. Um, and, and I definitely do think it is going to stabilize things, too, for our, our high school. So you have to know, throughout this budget process, as I meet with principals, I also meet with stakeholders, team chairs, and other folks. And I had the opportunity to go to the department meeting at the high school to talk exactly about this. And typically the high school, like I said, hasn't asked for a lot over the past couple of years. But this particular year, they were very vocal when I went to the building-based meeting and said, you have got to stabilize this because this is just not going to work long term. So... Um, you know, we heard them loud and clear. Mr. Bishop fully supported that. So I, I, I do feel like, to your point, and thank you for, for you know, agreeing to, um, you know, see the need. It's, it's just uh, definitely an opportunity for us to provide stability at two buildings by way of a, a, a simple point five. So can I just ask about that? So that'll give us four total psychologists, right? So what happens at Elmwood and Hopkins in the middle school? So, psychologists. yep. So at Elmwood and Hopkins, there's 0. 0.5 and 0. 0.5. Okay. So they have lesser testing numbers. Not that they have lesser um, responsibilities. They certainly are involved in crisis management and behavior support team. But when I analyzed, because I don't just analyze the caseload, I analyze the number of uh, legally binding testing in the requirements that are pertaining to that. And so at each of those levels, it's about 28 and 40. Whereas a pre-K through one in high school, you're talking 80 to 90. Um, and again, part of that is high school parent requests, students are going off to college. A lot of times families, in addition to the three-year reeval, they're asking students to be assessed. They're nervous about if their child's going to need a 504 and they want that testing done because that testing is a cost impact once you leave high school. It does. so, um, And that's a very understandable for families. So we do a lot of that as well as at the pre-K level, the opposite end of the spectrum, it's all these children are so young and they may have a disability and we're so scared and worried. So we've got a lot of evaluations from EI. So to your point, Jen, when our psychologist leaves the high school, she's not just going to Marathon. She's leaving the high school, getting her car, going to people's houses Mm -hmm. to assess these kids, then having to come back to the building, report out to the team, then jumping in the car and going back to the high school. Mm -hmm. So that is a lot of a lot of moving parts mm-hmm. where she has to report back to this team, then report to the high school and report back to the team about what's going on and try to crash into the meetings that she might miss might have missed part of. Um, so I do think it is just gonna be really great for stability long term. And now with that testing, for example, for the preschool for EI last year we had almost fifty evaluations just for children transitioning from EI. They don't all qualify for our program. So it's not an automatic, sure, come into our preschool program. We assess them. We um, determine if there is an educational disability that requires our public school special education service. So it's, it is a lot of time, but it's not an automatic welcome to our school. Um, and given the age of those students just turning three, within the pre-K-1, the three-year eval process, that's why there's so many in our level, because you have those who are just turning three, and then three years, they're still within our building. If they're coming in at right. three, they're still with us come first grade, that it's time for their three-year eval. <laughs> it's not that we love testing, but we do a lot of it. Yeah, it's just there's some rules. age-wise how it works out. Right. And then there's like I said, legal timelines that we have to abide by once the testing pro- process starts within a certain time frame, which is 45 days, you have to evaluate, write up conclusions, reconvene the team, and make recommendations. And so you have to think, when you have 90 students that you're testing, we've, and this is why I need secretarial support increased, particularly at the high school, they've got to help keep track of, okay, you've got to get a team in and by such and such a date, or you're going to be over the legal timeline. And we have to do that, because if we're making critical recommendations to students, we want to do it within a timely manner so we can get the services in place, because that takes time. Can I give one more? Yeah, please, please. <laughs> please do. Totally please monopolizing, do. I'm no, sorry. Okay. The, no. the one last comment I wanted to make is that I, I think that you've put a lot of thought, and I think that, you know, you have done a great job in justifying, you know, almost everything that you have here. I think the one tricky thing is, you know, if in your presentation there were a couple things that you you sort of mentioned might be we might consider to be luxury items that, um, you know, with full appreciation for how awesome the idea behind some of those things are, and you know, in a perfect world we'd be able to give all of these great things to all of the kids. Um, I think it's it's tricky to hear luxury item when you also hear 
we really need close to an 11 percent increase in budget, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's one of the one last comment, I guess, just something to think about is because I think, you know, all of the other things that you mentioned are you can justify and stand behind, and I think we have very little argument to say mm -hmm. any of these things are optional or luxury or any, you know, debatable sure. at all. Mm -hmm. um, but if something, you know, is is for a very theoretically awesome idea, mm -hmm. but is not necessarily a requirement or, you know, I think that's going to be tricky this year, mm -hmm. I suspect, anyway. So, I don't know, I just wanted to throw that out there because I feel like that's a, a piece that is hard, mm -hmm. you know. Sure. Anyway, there you go. Yeah, thank you. Now, Dr. Zaleski, this is the first uh, presentation of the operational budget. And is it fair to say that this is based on um, an expected increase of 234 kids for next year? Is that fair? Yes. Okay, so just wanted to keep that in mind for all of us, that that's what we are looking for in terms of increase. Um, having said that, I, I think uh, it's very clear to me that a lot of thought has gone in. You, um, I'm uh, very, very appreciative of the fact that you have worked with the CPAC members also clearly when you brought forth some of the things that you have brought forth. Um, um, and so a couple of questions on my mind. One, in terms of uh, programs, are there any other new programs that you're thinking that our student body needs that you would want to bring forth? Not yet. I think the enhancement of the 18 to 22 program, which is definitely a vision that I have for the district. Again, I don't know where we're going to go with that, but that is a program that is going to probably require some definitely more thought and analysis. Um, in addition, the work that we're doing with CPAC to enhance and advance what we're doing with our ESY programming. Um, and then with the increase of the psychologist, We've done a lot of work in the district to um, align our social-emotional programming. We will continue that work as we continue to offer the level of service delivery we have across the districts with different programming. So we'll continue that. Above and beyond that, as of this moment, I'm not creating anything new. I'm trying to stabilize and keep what we have and enhance what we have and do some work to further the advancement of particularly the 18 to 22 program and the work we're doing in CPEC and ESY. Um, from there, it's it's a matter of continued assessment as we continue to look at our you know our MCAS data and our scores and what are we doing academically in the in the different uh, you know environments in both ELA, ELA and math um, and what are the needs. We will always keep ass assessing that. Um, and I can certainly talk to you folks about that data at a different presentation, but we, you know, special education and looking at the overall scores for the district, we have made substantial progress toward our targets. So we're, we're doing well. Um, obviously, you always want to strive to keep improving. You never stop and get stale and stop analyzing that. We will continue to analyze that ongoing. But I think the three big things that I spoke of with the social emotional learning, the 18 to 22 and the ESY programming aligns in the CPAC programming aligns with current strategic plan items. So all of my vision and work is directly aligned to the strategic plan vision, um, which again, we always assess and we work to analyze as a, as a district group with Dr. Kavanaugh to assess what else we need to do in the special education department specifically. Please don't get me wrong. I, I think it's very clear that you are looking to further that case. I'm just sure. you know, wondering if there's anything additional that you're looking to do. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, you talked uh, surely you used the word luxury items, but I just want to point out those were the smaller number ones, right? Those were like the 3,000, 5,000 that you were talking about. Right. So the luxury items, and again, I apologize for the terminology. It's, it's, I, I say that with great trepidation because I worry about the grant. So, so for instance, the things that I put here, like $2,000 toward food and CPEC supplies, I don't consider that a luxury because we're doing really great work. Um, but if the grant comes in, that could be a luxury item. So if we needed to make a, a slight cut to the budget, that's something we could look at. But I would hate to do that because, if the, again, because the climate of the federal government, if we get cut in, in the grant funds and I'm not able to do this work, and let's say the fundraising didn't come in the way we were hoping it did, that could have an impact on our progress. So, so really, luxury item, it, it pertains to the work. In the current budget climate that we're in with enrollments and all of the needs, Certainly, if I had to make a, a shift or a decision, that's something I could look at. But I have to only look at that in comparison with FY uh, 
uh, 21, 240 grant projections, which I don't get until the summer. And that's the worry for me. That's the worry for me. So, and you're right, Mina, it's the smaller number items. Everything else that I presented, there is no wiggle room regarding transportation and contracted services and um, the staffing that we need because we have to be able to know that with all the students we have coming in, we can provide a safe level of support where they can continue to academically grow. I mean, the academic, social, emotional growth and needs of our student is just so imperative. And, um, and believe me, we sat around and around the table with principals and meeting and discussing what can we do, what, what do we need to do. And, and I have to let you know, in full transparency to this board, that's still a conversation that's ongoing. I know tonight is the first presentation, but we are still talking about other needs uh, across the district as we're looking at my budget. Um, and there may be a time where I have to come back and ask for more, truly. I, I want to be responsible in, in the budget process. And at this point in time, being before you tonight, these are definitely the needs. But we are continuing to have conversations ongoing, K to 12. That's great. And um, I also want to acknowledge the fact that throughout the year we've heard of, um, you know, some of the savings that you have been able to do for the district. Mm -hmm. uh, those are much appreciated. And I'm just wondering if we have any, um, you know, insight, any detail related to the state aid that we received related to this. Is that something um, related to the circuit breaker? So we really won't get any state aid. The very first state aid numbers that will come out will be in January. Um, the legislator is legislatures are looking at that um, you know student uh, success it, yet yeah, so um, the impact for Hopkinton however may not be impactful um, because Hopkinton is viewed as ability to pay the pieces that are in there that may be helpful is increased funding percentage for circuit breaker increased funding for MSBA for building projects that's that's big the actual chapter 70 flow through we may not really see um, an impact on that yep. Thank you very much. can I just have one quick question on um, transportation yes I was just wondering if you could give a quick um, some insight into what what that means what, it, what what when we're talking transportation I know we added a van and I know that's at full tilt yep. we're using that mm -hmm. um, are these contracted sort of one-off um, transportation things or do we have extra vans that we contract or yeah, what is so this? all of the above okay. <laughs> all of the above so we have students that we, we we transport and that's part of this cost we have students that are homeless with foster care in foster care situations that's additional costs we have monitors and that's additional costs we have one-offs um, and some of those one-offs are um, like I said we want students to participate in after-school activities and so we might pay extra fees we might have situations where except collaborative has been unable to provide us a van for support for a particular student need on a particular day. Sometimes we have an immediate need for a student, um, and this happens just happened this week. Sometimes we have an immediate need where we have to transport, except requires 48 hours. They're not able to transport. To me, it's non-negotiable, so I start the negotiation with various companies. So we sometimes need to contract outside of the uh, accept collaborative companies to meet the immediate student need, and so that's an additional cost as well. So it's all of those factors, Amanda, put together, um, which r relates to this increase in, in cost. You know, again, we try to eliminate barriers to, to service delivery for families and for students, and if transportation is going to be a barrier from a student getting to a program, we will do everything we can. Yeah. We had a case this week, like I said, I had a student that needed, had an immediate need to get into a program and I received multiple phone calls from stakeholders saying transportation is an absolute barrier for this family, you have to help. Um, and so we went above and beyond outside of accept to make that happen. Uh, Ms. Shagnon gets calls oftentimes about students wanting to participate in after school activities and sometimes parents aren't aware uh, right away that, oh my gosh, I didn't realize it was after school today. Can we please make this happen? And uh, Lydia Pacelli is great. She's one of my administrative assistants. She's really like a transportation coordinator. Um, and she will get right on the horn and start calling companies right away to get people, you know, in place to pick up students. So we don't want them to miss out. We don't want them to miss out because it's very unmotivating. You know, if we have, if transportation is a barrier to families, it's discouraging and it's unmotivating to the students and, and it causes a inconsistency in, in the programs and the services they're able to access. And we never want to deny access, equal access especially. So just because I'm not familiar, so do we provide sort of single runs for as needed? So we if can. a child, say, 
I love the idea of enabling after school activities. I think that's critical for mm. social development I agree too. and engagement. So if somebody's going to commit for ideally a semester, say, mm -hmm. half a year of an after school activity, would we then contract with we, with a regular run for that person? Or? Yeah, so again, Accept is our primary vendor. So if there's an immediate need, we might have to use like Vanpool or Hunter or something okay. like that. But if we, if it's a known entity, like let's say someone wants to join, you know, basketball at a program, um, we will, and let's say it's every Wednesday at, you know, from three to four, and typically the van goes out to the program and picks the other children up at, you know, 150, because they have other children from other programs on these routes, then we will contract above and beyond what we're already paying for it to have accept a van driver specifically available for that student to pick them up after the activity and bring them home to where they need to be. Um, and that happens more often than not, and we are trying to do that more often than not because, again, we don't want to deny students opportunities to expand their wings, so to speak, and live and have a life, a productive life, where they can access a range of opportunities. And again, it's all about equal access. We provide that access here at, the, at our school setting, so if students are in out of district and they want that equal access, we're not going to provide a, a barrier for them. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I just have, you know, just for the benefit of uh, anyone watching or anyone present, there are a few acronyms here. Um, a little further, the new personnel request. If you wouldn't mind clarifying some of those for everyone's sake, um, you know, the B paraprofessional versus the C, um, LST, or uh, some of those that might help folks understand those better. Sure. Uh, you took like the ABA paraprofessional versus the SPED paraprofessional. Okay. So ABA paraprofessional, typically in our district, we, so we have levels of paraprofessionals. Um, so A, B, and C. And A, you will never see in my budget because that's a general education paraprofessional. Those are folks that work, you know, they're library assistants and they're providing the academic support environment support that you would never see. When you see SPED paraprofessional, that is referred to as our Bs. And those are the paraprofessionals that provide support in the inclusion classrooms, in the moderate inclusion classrooms. They're providing um, you know, assistance with implementation of the modification of instruction. They do provide behavior support, but not to the degree of the ABA para. So when you see ABA para, that's what we refer to as our C-level paraprofessional. And those are our most intensive paraprofessionals to support students with significant um, either social emotional needs or uh, support with intensive um, discrete trial instruction and, serve and delivery of that, one to one support. Um, ABA paraprofessionals are not just for students who are dysregulated or need that specialized instruction support, but it's also for students with medical issues. We've had students in our district who might need um, assistance with mobility. In, in and out of the classrooms or um, getting to the gym or to the cafeteria. So one-to-one -one support paraprofessionals may do that as well. So if you really think of it in terms of um, tiers, A is kind of the tier one general education, the Bs are providing the inclusion and the instruction support, and then the Cs are the most intensive level. So I'm really glad you asked that question, Mina. So just so we can let folks know, the way that we make decisions about student service delivery is we will look at the IEP, we will analyze the need and what's written in the IEP on the service delivery, and then we set, we meaning myself, special educators, principal, and team chair, to determine what type of paraprofessional needs to be with this kiddo. Is it a B? Is it a C? Is it an ABA? It's bad, same terminology. Um, or can they function in the general classroom with the general supports? Um, and so I, I am glad that you asked that so people can understand the distinction of our decision making and how we get there as a district. Because oftentimes it may feel like we come before <coughs> a school committee asking for paras, but we need the support. We need the support. The students need to be able to access the curriculum as well as be safe in the learning environment and be mobile. We have Mr. Mike Manning here today from uh, Appropriations. Uh, Mr. Manning, do you have any questions? I do. Okay. Would you come like up. to come up, please? Uh, We're working I'm on it. Put you, put you down Manning. there. We're working on it. Changed our configuration a little bit. Where's the mic? Okay. Oh, hello. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I just want to make sure I understand that I'm, I'm not questioning anything you have about Please. special education. It's just that I understand the numbers, um, that 
you had an increase of 8.3 percent, and then you had the new requests did, of was it 400 something thousand dollars? Is that included in that 8.3 percent? Yes. So that's that's current contractual and, uh, and all, the new, all the new requests. Right. Okay, that was it. Thank you. Right. <laughs> it was, to, me, to me, it was an important question because it, it wasn't very sure. right in there. Okay. I apologize if we weren't clear enough. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you, for you the question. Mr. Mamish. Um, I know we have members from the CPAC board also here, and I know Dr. Zleski, you've already worked uh, with the team. So I'm hoping, uh, you know, if there are any questions related to the budget, you know, this is an ongoing process, so we are happy to entertain emails, questions um, from everyone here. Did you want to say something? Uh, you don't have to. I'll make sure to put it out on social media if anybody has any questions. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you. much. We appreciate it very much. Any, no further questions, I assume? Is that fair? No. Okay, no. great. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Mrs. Jabot. Yep. We'll be seeing you soon. <laughs> no, Okay, um, the next item on the agenda, the technology budget presentation, Mr. Ghosh. how technology works here. <laughs> what was that? All right, perfect. I'm here tonight to talk about the FY21 budget for technology. Um, just to talk a little bit about the district technology priorities uh, for the upcoming year. Uh, this budget kind of supports the alignment of K-12 curriculum uh, and some of the new Massachusetts technology standards, which has been a strategic initiative we've been working on for the last uh, year or so. Uh, some of the data privacy work that we've been working on with a lot of our applications and software tools in the district. Uh, the district budget will also support maintenance of all of our systems, hardware, software, and any de device repairs uh, that need to take place in the upcoming year. Um, instructional software, uh, which primarily supports learning, um, specifically math and reading enrichment and intervention programs across the board. And then finally, all of the uh, network structures, both wired and wireless network structures and security systems uh, throughout the, the district. Uh, the first part is talking about the personal personnel summary for this year. Um, I am uh, coming back and asking for a 1.0 FTE. Uh, primarily uh, designated as a website slash data position. Um, this was asked uh, last year but was uh, not funded. Uh, we did have a stipend in position to kind of help us get along, uh, but based on the amount of work uh, that has gone into the new website and the amount of work that's required to maintain it, we feel that a stipend in position is really not adequate uh, to get the site to where it needs to be. Um, and beyond that, um, with the increase in enrollment and the number of accounts, the number of tools that we are using, this position could also be used to support um, the data uh, across the, the district. So it could be helping support with communications, mass emailings, updating all of the digital forms that we have across the board that really haven't been updated in some areas and really need some work. So I feel this position could help um, support a number of areas uh, within our department and across the district. Uh, the next uh, accounts are expense accounts across the board. Uh, the tech contracted service account, and these are just up or down uh, based on this year compared to last year. So the increase for this year is around 28,000 uh, for the technology contracted service account. This account uh, basically supports all of the main uh, contracts that we have across the board. So supporting PowerSchool, uh, supporting our main internet connection, 
uh, some of our security services, some of our management software uh, is primarily funded in this account. Uh, this increase this year is due to um, the addition of a new ELL uh, system we put in place at the end of last year uh, and other services like Khajiit. Khajiit, uh, I mentioned, is a, a MiFi type unit. So we have some students in the district now that do not have access to Internet at home and uh, accessing the Internet has become an important part of accessing the curriculum. So these students are able to take these types of devices home. Uh, to access curriculum so they can get to digital textbooks in their homework assignments. So we've added those this year and those will need to be funded um, next year. The technology maintenance account uh, this year is level funded uh, at $75,000. That's not an increase. So the, the entire account is $75,000. So what that means is that is the amount of money we have to support everything that plugs in across the district. Uh, it is a significant amount of money, but compared to what some of the technologies cost this day, it's not that significant. For example, we had speakers that blew out at the middle school auditorium that had to be replaced this year. Those were $13,000. So that would come out, that type of expense would come out of this account. So very quickly, this money can be eaten away depending on the, on the year or any given event. Um, our AV supplies are up $15,000 this year. Um, this, this account is supporting uh, the maintenance of all of the um, LCD projectors like the one you see up on the wall up there in all of the classrooms. Uh, this account primarily is up because I moved uh, these uh, projectors from instructional technology to AV because it, I think it's more fitting for them to be in the AV accounts. So that's why you see the overall increase is much higher. Uh, but roughly 16 projectors could be purchased across the district uh, with these funds. So roughly five here at the high school, five at the middle school. Uh, and then a few at the elementary schools as need be. So we look at the oldest ones that are out of date and, and not working very well, and we look to replace those. The instructional technology account, um, and these are accounts across all of the buildings, uh, are down uh, $17,000, which is great. Uh, and this is where a lot of our leases and a lot of our devices uh, for staff and students are purchased from. Um, so... Even though this account is down, this would still provide a laptop refresh for elementary uh, teachers this year uh, and would look to replace some of the aging uh, iPads at uh, grade two at Elmwood School. Uh, I believe those are now uh, from 2012, some of the iPads, and are, I think, Gen 4. And my techs were telling me today that they cannot be updated anymore. So they are at an OS, and they have to stay at that OS, and there are some incompatibility issues that we need to address. Um, the, the next line item, instructional software. Uh, this supports all of the software across all of the buildings uh, for instruction. Uh, there is an increase uh, in this account uh, across a couple of the buildings, primarily high school, middle school, and some at Hopkins. Uh, this helps support all of the curriculum. And uh, this year, there are some of the, the courses, for example, world languages, where they're, they're not using te textbooks at all and they need other digital tools to kind of help support their curriculum. Uh, and so, therefore, there's some increase to um, purchase some of those tools. The library account's not major, but it's up 70, $700 uh, at Marathon School, primarily because of a software tool called Pebble Go that the librarian is using. So it's not a, a huge item, but just thought I'd explain why that, there's an increase there. Uh, and the last big account that we use across the board is our professional development account. Uh, this account primarily funds uh, curriculum writing for any teachers throughout the year or through the summer. Uh, so, for example, a lot of the units of study by the secondary teachers uh, leverage some of these funds this year to help make their units ready for publication on the website. Uh, this is also supporting our FUSE Fellow project this year and helping um, fund some of the teachers as they go out and, and coach others, uh, and then helps train our technical staff uh, on tools and, and products as we use them across the district. And that's it. So I'm happy to answer questions. Those are kind of summaries of each accounts. Um, I think the, the main ideas, the main trends across the board is we are able to move forward with, with some of our, our device purchases and maintenance without large increases because we have spaced out the leases over a number of years and those rotations seem to be paying off now. So you don't see any large spikes necessarily uh, in, our, in our budget. Uh, software as a whole is kind of up. 
partially because of enrollment. Um, you know, looking back at this time last year compared to the enrollment this year, it's almost 200 people different. So when you start to add up these licenses across the board, that, that software account can go up quite, quite quickly. Um, and then beyond that, it would be the additional staff member, which would be the driving force uh, in this year's budget. Okay. I'm happy to entertain any questions. Questions? Uh, I had a question and a comment. I'll give the comment. It first is the Khajiit. I think that's fabulous. Uh, I was not aware that that was a possibility that the district could provide internet for students who lack it. Uh, and then the other question is, in terms of the webmaster, the the stipended position that is in place this year, mm -hmm. about how many, what what percent of a full-time employee is that person working now? So it's a full-time employee, that, and they, they get the stipend, and that equates to about three to five hours of, of work a week. So, so it's, three to five hours a week, is a, but that's not a full-time missing. It's so so the, it's a full-time teacher. So the, the okay, person so is, is a, a full-time full high school teacher that was awarded the stipend position. And so the stipend amount was about $6,000 for the year. Okay. So, so over that year, they're, they're roughly, you know, working a few hours a week to, to earn that to stipend. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question along those same lines, too, because I, I'm fully on board with the idea of the webmaster. I was disappointed when it was taken out of the budget last year, so I, I fully appreciate where you're coming from. How did you come up with the $60,000 number, though? Well, last year it was around 80000 so I'm being a little more optimistic. So that's what I was wondering, because <laughs> when I saw sixty, I was like, can you yeah. get a webmaster for sixty grand? I don't well, know if you're going to get it. It depends, I <laughs> guess, in how work? many years of experience they have. So right. I guess I'm hoping if we got someone on the younger side that you know maybe has a little more social media experience, is just out of school, that has that fresh new look, would would be someone we could train and work grand. with, right? <laughs> okay. But I think what we really need is someone, a workhorse that can do that, right? The site is, is built and, and there's a structure there. We, we need someone that communicates well, writes well, can work on a lot of different projects, can network with administrators and teachers and, and kind of tell our story. And so I don't think we need a high-end developer to do that. I think we need someone that has some skills across a, a wide uh, a range of you know areas <laughs> from okay. Photoshop to taking photos to writing. Okay. So that helps. All right. Yeah. That's but fair. I know it yeah. just seemed. Low if I got out of college and had a sixty thousand dollars. Yeah. Right. I'd exactly. be happy. So right. <laughs> do what you got to do. But <laughs> so. yeah. Let's be honest. The college students are like, aside from you, most of us at this table, probably the college students are well ahead of yeah. technology. It's true. It's true. Other questions? Comments? Yeah, I just want to also echo the support for the webmaster. And I think it's hard, you know, we, we understand the need to put, say, teachers or special ed pairs, I mean, right in front of kids. Mm -hmm. And we think of something like a web, webmaster, and it sounds kind of fluffy. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that the work has to get done. Parents, teachers, students need access to information, and that falls a lot on our administrators, our principals, our assistant principals, and that takes them away from the kids. So I think. Well, it seems fluffy to some. To me, it, I mean, in our growing, hectic pace, you know, world that we're living in, that you're living in, it's actually not at all fluffy. And it makes other things run so much more smoothly and frees up time from uh, student-facing members of the district that, you know, I, I consider it more critical uh, for that reason. So I'm hoping that it stays in the budget this, this year. I mean, obviously, it's going to be a difficult year, but I'm really hoping that it stays at, because I hear from the principals, like through our website subcommittee and talking to people, maintaining information and pulling data out for reporting, it, et cetera, is a huge part of the job. And it's not really where we want those people to have to spend their time. So it's I'm very supportive. Of it is hard, because we're putting a lot of pressure, as you said, on those people, plus even the building secretaries who are faced with a hundred different problems a day and I'd say, oh, can you update this or change this? And it's just, it's a struggle. It is, so. yeah. So thank you for asking and oh. thank you for putting yeah. this together. Thank you so much. Mr. Ghosh, I just have a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, first, I want to say, you know, your department is the one which, when everything is working fine, no one says anything, and the moment something goes wrong, we're all over it. So we appreciate you keeping everything up to date, making things work and um, you know technology has become such a part of our lives and certainly in the education of the kids and we're so dependent. Um, I uh, just have a couple of questions sure. for you with regard to uh, you know when you spoke in your 
um, summary overview. You mentioned 5.4 percent prior to the staff uh, request. Were you thinking that might not go through? Why is that not included? No, in the I think we were waiting for munis updates and, and some things that happened. So when I was in first putting the budget together, I don't think I had the, the combination of the staff. And I don't know, Susan, if you have the total that in, includes the staff or not. I'm not sure what overall percentage I am. But I think with the staff position, I think I, I want to put a number out there that's not true. But I think it's around 6 I guess 6.8 if I had to guess, but. Hold on. Sorry. 8.5. 8.5 along with the 60,000. When we add the 60,000. That's correct. Within the department. Sure. So yeah. the departmental increase is 8.5. Okay. okay. Not, over, not the overarching budget. Mm -hmm. So the reason you get these reports the way you do with existing staff is because all of these new requests have not been passed yet. So we have not entered them into MUNIS. Um, so that's why what you get now from Munis gives you the percentage of existing staff, existing expenses, um, without the new personnel requests. Yeah. Um, the second uh, question I have actually is on this Munis report, looking at the last two items, the total expenses and the grand total. So we should be looking to the grand total. Is, is that fair? The grand total, correct. Okay. So the personal expenses is, is your staff, and then the expenses are, you know, contracted service, et cetera. So it's, it's split okay. between personnel and expenses. And then the grand total is the total for the department. So which is at $2 million, is that correct? correct? That's correct. Okay. So, and the percentage increase, the 5.4 would actually show as 8.5? If, we if add you in, add in that 60,000 60, into that. Okay, right. that's great. Thank, thank you for clarifying. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a little conflicted, um, and I speak only as a single member um, on the committee, of course, um, about uh, the website webmaster position. I understand the need, and I know how much work has gone, and we've built this website. And if you don't have someone working on it, uh, you know, it's not as effective as we would like it to be. Um, at the same time, we know we are in a place where we have many, many needs. Uh, I wonder if we can look to some other opportunities with the technologists growing up, you know, numbers in the community growing, if there is any way, you know, especially with some of the forms, etc. if we can recruit some volunteers, if that's a possibility. I know everything is not possible by volunteers, mm -hmm. but if that in combination with the current stipend position, uh, I just want, I would like you to think about it uh, with all the needs that will come forth. Uh, sure. Right. That's fair. Uh, yeah. And one last comment was on the Khajiit that you mentioned. I know that some libraries, I don't know about our library, some libraries also offer um, those kinds of services, you know, uh, to be able to take home a mobile hotspot device and utilize that. I wonder if our library is doing that and if there is a um, collaboration I don't know for sure, but I could, I could check. Just I, some I thoughts check, yeah. uh, to think about. Re I really appreciate you bringing forth yet another thoughtful uh, presentation here. Yes. You're welcome. Thank Mr. You. Manning, Thank did so you have much. any questions? Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Ghosh. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, buildings and grounds budget presentation. Mr. Person. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I haven't hey. seen you in a long time, it seems to me. <laughs> I've been hiding out. <laughs> my many projects through the district over this year. So I'm presenting the fiscal year 21 buildings and grounds uh, budget. Sorry, I'm just trying to, which one of these you set up on? You want, you want us to project it? Yeah, you can. We will do that.
There you are, sir. All right, thank you. So the preliminary FY21 uh, buildings and grounds budget reflects an increase of $285,482, or 9%. Uh, the increase consists of 102668 in regular salary increases uh, through the uh, now new contract that we signed uh, with the custodial and maintenance staff. Um, and an increase of 182,814 um, in contracted ser services and extraordinary maintenance. So first I'll roll through the <coughs> personnel summary. So what we're looking for this year is to add to my 0.5 secretarial position to make it a full-time position. Um, reason being is that as these projects are coming in, uh, having a 0.5 secretarial position although very helpful. I just need a little extra help um, kind of managing the paperwork of the projects that we've been taking on. Um, I think even since I've started here, there's been a, <laughs> seems to be a big project every year, uh, finishing up the marathon school, turf fields, bus parking lots, and then um, what Dr. Kavanaugh is proposing for this coming up year will, uh, I think, keep us plenty busy. Um, <laughs> And then the other, uh, the other item I'm looking for or, uh, is three additional custodians throughout the district. Uh, this request was originally for six new custodians uh, through our first round of budget goes through, uh, going through the budget. Uh, Dr. Kavanaugh and Ms. Rothermick um, asked that we trim that back a little bit, which we have. I do have some reasoning for wanting um, originally six custodial positions, but and, and I can go through that. Um, so as we're looking at kind of guidelines in cleaning a building, there is uh, five. They're not nationally recognized, but they're, they're getting there. Uh, guidelines that uh, facilities directors are using, uh, not just in schools, but throughout the, you know, throughout the facilities world. So just to give a quick overview, a level one um, would be a spotless building. Uh, it'd be found in a hospital or you know a corporate suite. At this level, the prop with the proper supplies and tools, um, a custodian could do between ten and eleven thousand square feet per an eight-hour shift. A level two, um, in the standard standards, a best one, um, worst five. Level two cleaning is the utmost standard for most school cleaning and is generally reserved for restrooms, special education areas, kindergarten areas, or food service areas. A custodian can clean approximately 18,000 to 20,000 square feet in an eight-hour shift. Level three uh, cleaning, and this is the one that we're trying to achieve through our program here, level three is cleaning a normal, uh, normal amount for most school facilities. Um, it's uh, acceptable to most stakeholders and does not pose any health issues. Uh, custodian can clean approximately 28 to 31,000 square feet in eight hours. Level four is not normally acceptable in a school environment. Classrooms would be cleaned every other day. Carpets would be vacuumed every third day and dusting would occur once a month. At this level, a custodian can clean 45 to 50,000 square feet per eight hours. And then a level five, um, <coughs> cleaning can be very rapid uh, and lead to an unhealthy situation. Trash cans might be emptied and carpets vacuumed on a weekly basis. One custodian could clean 85,000 to 90,000 square feet per an eight hour period. So how do we stack up, right? Um, so in the high school we currently have, and, and I'm only including night custodians, not the day custodian who has a little bit different job than what the night custodians do. Um, we have five night custodians cleaning approximately 38,000 square feet each, which currently falls between a level three and a level four. Not terrible. Um, but if we were using the top level of 31,000 square, 31, square feet, we would need to add one additional custodian. In the middle school, which is 160,000 square feet, we have three night custodians cleaning approximately 53,333 square feet each which currently falls between a level four and a five. Um, if we were using the top range, again, of the 31,000 square feet, we would need five night custodians or an additional two. Um, and if you go back and look at what you're getting for 
uh, level four and level five, you know, it's it, we're, we're getting into dangerous territory. At the Elmwood School, which is approximately 80,000 square feet, we have one and a half night custodians cleaning approxim approximately 53,333 square feet each. And that falls between a level four and a five. <laughs> and again, using the 31,000 feet, square feet, we would need uh, 2.5 or an additional one custodian. Hopkins, also about 80,000 square feet. We currently have 1.5 night custodians cleaning approximately 53,000 uh, square feet each. Well, that one's a little skewed because we have, um, we, we fall between a level four and a five. We would need an additional custodian. Marathon school, we're in pretty good shape. Um, we currently have two and a half night custodians clean, cleaning approximately 37,200 square feet each, which falls between a level three, and I forgot to put a level four in there. Um, but we would need to add an additional 0.5 custodian to that, uh, to that school. Um, so, you know, that being said, um, I think our night staff does a very good job cleaning the buildings, and they're, they're, they're working really hard. One of the issues that we run into, though, is if the, the way the system works, if a, if a day custodian takes a vacation or a vacation day or sick day, one of the night custodians from that school fills in for that day position, which would leave a half a custodian to clean that building that night. So we're spending, um, you know, I think a considerable amount of overtime when we come up to those vacation weeks and, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, it's really kind of a, a two-level thing of what we're trying to accomplish. We want to get our buildings as clean as possible, and we want to make sure we have enough coverage to um, clean the buildings when... Uh, the custodians aren't available to be there. Uh, <clears throat> the other portion is the expense summary. So in the expenses, this consists of, it's 182814 and consists mostly of contracted services of 91550 and extraordinary maintenance of $76,200. Um, so for this year, so why this looks a little, may sound a little skewed. So what we did this year was we had a lot of money in about $100,000 in contracted services that really belonged in our repair and maintenance accounts. Um, so what we did this year was we moved that money over so we can better track our spend in each school when it comes to services that we're, you know, providing and, and things that we're fixing. Um, so we moved that money over, which really ramped up my repair and maintenance accounts, um, but it kind of leveled off because I pulled it from one place to put it to another. Where I added into contracted services was 91550 and that was um, and that is to get a preventative maintenance program going for our HVAC equipment at uh, 81550 So that's... Um, essentially having your filters, your rooftop filters changed, your belts on your equipment changed, everything greased. Um, the other service that it provides to us is that having an HVAC tech look through the equipment as they're doing the PMs, they're able to spot deficiencies in the equipment and we're able to address them faster than, you know, the day it breaks and we have no heat or we have no cooling in a building. Um, <coughs> And then we also added $10,000 for uh, district water testing. So um, I think it was right before I started, we ran a program through the LCCA, um, which uh, lead and copper uh, initiative from the state. Um, and we had a lot of uh, bubblers that came back in the high copper or high lead um, uh, zones. So uh, taking a few webinars and learning more about the, the process, we found that it's, the, it's not our water from the town and it's not the pipes coming into the building, but it's the age of the uh, bubbler units themselves or water fountain units themselves that when the water sits in there, that's when it's collecting the, the high levels of copper or lead. Um, so... Uh, uh, my predecessor had shut a lot of those down, and what we'd like to do is get them back up and running, retest the water. Um, we've been replacing, starting to replace bubblers throughout the system, or water fountains, bubbler. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Um, so we're starting to um, replace those throughout the system, and we're in a current testing program that we had put in for last year. So we want to um, continue testing throughout the years to make sure we're providing safe drinking water uh, for the students. The extraordinary maintenance accounts. So I don't know if you'll remember a couple years ago, in an order to get our budget um, into better shape, we took a lot of our extraordinary maintenance and we made capital packages out of capital. Am I saying that right? Capital packages out of them. Um, so, for instance, HVAC exhaust fan, uh, fans. We took those and we put them into one package and we called it a capital item. Um, and that worked for the for the first couple years that we did it, and now the town has requested that we don't do that anymore. So we're taking our extraordinary maintenance, which would be anything twenty five thousand dollars or less that the school needs to replace equipment or HVAC equipment or grounds equipment and stuff and uh, items of that to replace. So. At the Elmwood School, um, what we're looking to do is um, repair the, I don't know if you've been down Elmwood, but the sidewalk coming from the street down into the building has deteriorated, so we'd like to get that fixed so it's safe for people to walk on. Um, <clears throat> replace some outdated cafeteria equipment, so a lot of our ca cafeteria equipment, we've replaced some last year. We're trying to get into a program where we get that up and running we find that we're spending a lot of money in repairs on equipment that can be 20 years old and so it feels like you're just throwing good money after bad you know so we want to be able to start replacing or continue replacing that equipment and then some of the carpets in the classrooms if you haven't been in there we've been on a bit of a program the last couple of years trying to do two or three classrooms a, a season to to get them up to um you know, a, a functioning level. Hopkins, um, we're looking for funding for flooring repairs, um, and that's crack tiles that are happening throughout the building. Those, the, you know, these buildings, Hopkins and the high school, are coming up on 20 something years old now. Um, so, this is what we're going to start finding that we have to replace throughout these buildings as well cafeteria, refrigeration equipment, exhaust fan replacements, hot water pump for the heating system. Um, the middle school at 42,000, we're looking to replace uh, broken water fountains, repair cracked tiles in the floors there, replace uh, maintenance shop garage doors, they're almost unoperable. Um, and then we'd like to start seeing what we could do to get some of the restrooms a little updated in the, in the middle school. So not a full gut and renovation, but um, I have some support. <laughs> Um, but to be able to clean them up and, and hopefully get them in a little better shape. Um, the high school, um, again, flooring, uh, new cafeteria doors. It was a couple of years ago, the cafeteria doors, um, a student had grabbed it and pulled a little too, too tough when it was locked and cracked them, but they're fire doors, so those are um, a little pricey. Um, and again, through here, replace water fountains. Uh, that total for the high school would be 56,000. Uh, and then the district, and that's anything that's kind of outside of the schools, right? So the ground stuff, like, uh, 195 to um, for a new portable generator, grounds and grounds irrigate, irrigation controls. Uh, so those irrigation controls were put in the early 90s and are you know, we're piecing them back together. Um, and then this bottom, uh, Susan could probably speak to the revolving accounts better than I can, but um, that did not change from last year to this year. So that's what I have. It's kind of a lot of information. Questions. Yes. If you don't, wouldn't mind actually yeah. moving back up a bit, I think that one sheet was probably missing. One um, sheet was missing? Yes, just that one. Which one? The second in the packet. Uh, the establishing. Oh, it wasn't in the packet. The next one, I think. No. It was the next one. If you mm -hmm. move a little bit. Oh, Susan, you're controlling it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I've got control. This page? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's Okay. Great. <laughs> that's all. Uh, questions, comments, thoughts? So, um, I, uh, I just have two comments, really. Sure. First, thank you for this detail. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I'd ask some of these questions. I either we missed this page or I don't know. This, mm -hmm. um, this was very helpful in understanding sort of what level of custodial, um, you know, achievement, I guess, we're, if we're sure. staffing toward right now yeah. and what we think we're looking to do with the staffing requests. So yeah. knowing that we're like a four to five and we're trying to get to a three definitely helps in yeah. the square footage and all. So I appreciate that. Uh, that's why we wanted to add that in there, just so you had some frame of reference that it wasn't just you know, we're throwing bodies at a non-problem. I think it's, um, you know, potentially could become a problem. Like I said, our staff does a really good job at night, and they really bust their butts. What I didn't include in the square footages was that we have uh, one of the night custodians from here actually clean the administration building, and then one of the uh, middle school custodians cleans the White House um, or the 18 to 22-year-old program. Um, so they, you know, so again, it takes them a little bit of time. They get over there, set up, do their thing, and then come back to finish, or they're doing it at the end of their shifts. Um, and then what's also not in there is any of the proposed uh, square footages for any of the new classrooms that we, you know, may hopefully add to the uh, system that's coming up in years. Uh, my only other comment is uh, sort of similar to technology. Mm -hmm. These are difficult budgets because yeah. they don't exactly face students. Yeah. It's not about learning, but as we're all homeowners and we know that if you don't do the maintenance, mm -hmm. um, it can be extraordinarily costly. So it's just a tough balancing act. I appreciate all the detail and thought you put into this, and we're just going to have you. to see what we can manage, I think. I mean, it all makes sense. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, it's just a difficult balancing act. Mm -hmm. So appreciate it. Can you say a little bit about that reduction? You'd initially propose six custodians. So uh, I initially proposed six custodians. Um, so at six custodians, that would take all of the buildings to a level three okay. or five and a half custodians. I probably should have adjusted that number. Um, five and a half custodians would take all the buildings to a level three. Uh, with three custodians, we're going to um, try to find where our most need is, which looks like the middle school and um, the elementary schools and try to plug uh, people into there. Um, but it doesn't include the modular classrooms if those are approved. Which doesn't include the modular right. classrooms, right? Or the addition, or the addition, or on, the the addition on the high school. Or the addition on the high school, right. yeah. <laughs> because it's good to know the industry standard. I'm sorry I'm interrupting you. And to see sort of where we fall. Yeah. And, and I know you said it's not like an official standard, but it's yeah. still, I mean, it seems like a reasonable standard. And it makes me wonder, too, if they're taking into, I mean, we have 4,000 kids right. who may or may not be quite as respectful of the cleanliness <laughs> of a place as 4,000 adults might be. So I think, I, I, you know, how that factors into the industry standard, Yeah. you know, we need to sort of take that into account, what sure. our custodians are dealing with on a daily basis in yeah. buildings, yeah. The, the Sorry, other piece to keep in mind in terms of the industry standard, uh, a building like Marathon really should be at a level two. So if you saw that, that's really geared towards the, the younger ones, the really messy ones, right. you know, okay. the ones that are doing the paint. Um, so a, a Marathon building really should be, it's, it's the one that is the younger children, um, the preschool, you know, that level of cleaning is different than a high school. Right. And they also have younger immune systems. And, I mean, right. you need... Yeah. A, a and less high, their hygiene is different less than, yes. than yeah. an older yeah. kid, you know, so... Or maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm going to say, I have teenage boys, so I don't... Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know. As the words are coming out of my mouth, I'm going to take it back. Never mind, but... Sorry, I you. No, I, I just find these levels very helpful and interesting, too. I, I can't imagine, even at level four classrooms would be clean every other day. I mean, if you have 25, 26 kids in a classroom and you're not cleaning it every day. Yeah, and, and it yeah. does. It happens a lot. So right now in the high school, I believe the program is to have three sweep nights a week. Now, that doesn't mean we leave a classroom a mess. The custodians check the classrooms and they'll do spot cleaning. But to do a full sweep, we're only doing those in the high school three nights a week. So if there's an event and someone's paying for facility use, mm -hmm. Is there a, an associated fee that would cover overtime or additional custodial that yeah. should be a wash for that event? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, all our events are ch charged the custodial overtime that it takes to, to work those events, okay. except if they're school-related events. Right. Obviously, we're not, I'm not charging the music department 
you know, to have a concert, you know, so yeah. just taking them out of one pocket and putting the other. But for outside groups, yes, we charge custodial overtime and, um, you know, the rental fee for the for the building. And that's a tiered, that's a whole nother subject. That's a tiered system um, with uh, the community users in, you know, in town groups have one price <coughs> and then, you know, the lowest price and then outside users would have the highest price per room rental. Go ahead, sorry. I, I would echo everyone's comments on the, how helpful the leveling thing is. It, it actually, though, leaves me with some concerns about um, where we're at and even kind of adding the staff in where we'll be next year, I, particularly hearing that Marathon should really be a level two mm -hmm. and that I, I can imagine that most parents in the district um, would never want to know that that we're between levels yeah. four and five right now. Uh, it would a lot of people out. It, it would skeeve a lot of people out, yeah. and I think that's a list we don't want to be on. It's like the earliest <laughs> yeah, right. classes in America. Well, and, and, I'll, and I'll state again that the custodians really do a great job at each of the schools, and yeah. we make sure that we're um, trying to take care of the you know, the necessary messes and, and so on and so forth. Um, I don't want to leave an impression that the schools are dirty. Um, I think they're relatively clean, but I think we could do better, you well, know. And that said, I, I, I have kids in different schools. I've never yeah. gone in the school and thought, wow, yeah. we're a dirty school. <laughs> so obviously your, your yeah. crews are working very hard and doing a great job. But I, I would kind of bounce back with it is three really going to be enough to kind of keep our schools yeah. where we need them to be. Right. No, uh, I, I think, again, you know, going through the budget presentation, you know, through the budget with Dr. Kavanaugh and Ms. Rothermick, that, you know. It's hard choices. We'd, mm -hmm. we'd love six. Right. <laughs> Have you looked at the balance between um, the overtime that the current custodians put in versus hiring a new, I mean, you probably have, I, I, figuring out. You know, where the tipping point is, I guess, and so, whether they want to work over Yeah, that we, much we've overtime. looked at it, and it's, um, I'm shooting a number off the top of my head, and I don't know if I should. We're at 54000 in overtime. Yeah, the, the difficulty is um, adding staff will help because we do not have subs. We're unable to hire subs. Um, so the the staff that are that we currently have, you know, as as Tim said, is covering vacations and sick time. We don't have that sub, so that person is now working maybe eight hours during the day and four hours at night just to try to get a little bit in. Mm -hmm. So that's obviously at, at overtime as opposed to straight pay. So having additional staffing may alleviate that eight hours of overtime because now you can make it with, you know, you can't make it with a half-time person to clean an entire building. So that does help. But that said, there are so many events such as concerts and things like that where we just don't have a choice and it does bring into overtime. So, you know, school events, you're you're going to have yeah. your and we have a ton yeah. and we will <laughs> have we will have Which overtime good, yeah. i mean that's really what the school is all about right is you know then being able to put on the concerts and showcase the kids right. and but you do need to have staff cover that and that they will be subs yeah. i mean they will be overtime mm -hmm. so and do you think the guy the folks that work in this uh, the custodians do they do they rely on it? Do they want that over time? Or is it something that's so, a burden on them? No, I don't think it's a burden on them. I think they enjoy the overtime, but there's only so much you can work right. as well. You know, right. So I, I think none of them mind a couple hours a week, but I think if you're hitting your 40 hours and then working another 20 hours, that's a, that's a lot on anybody. And yeah. they have families and and uh, people that they want to get to. And um, and I think, you know, maybe you could do it for one week, but if it's a sustained thing, it just gets to be rough. And, and even at a custodial level, you don't want to burn anybody out, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. So, Susan, when you say um, we are unable to hire subs, is it that there is no supply in the marketplace or they have to be trained at our schools? There's no supply in the marketplace. Okay. Unemployment is so low at this point in time it may as well be zero. We have several positions that we've been advertising for <laughs> some for years, yeah. uh, and we just get zero applicants. Wow. Okay. Oh. Uh, 
again an excellent presentation just want to echo what everyone has said I think knowing all of this level of detail actually from the time you have come on board I've seen the level uh, you know it keeps going up a notch every year oh, thank you um, so thank you for all the work and just educating us on all this work sure. I was actually thinking you will ask for a right hand person for you <laughs> given all the building um, that we are expecting sure. in the upcoming year that would require a lot of planning mm -hmm. that would require a lot of going through the boards and committees and whatnot it's a lot of work sure uh, that you'll be taking on so i was surprised not to see another <laughs> you know a right hand person like i said yeah um, well I'll, uh, and they're both my bosses, so, but I'll say it anyway. Um, I really get a lot of support from Dr. Kavanaugh and Ms. Rothermick when it comes to this, um, when it comes to planning and, and helping um, understand what needs to happen. Um, the support level I get from the top down has been really great. So um, I think keeping the buildings clean was more important than getting me a little, a little help in that aspect. You know, we'll. I'll keep plugging away. I like it here in Hawkington. <laughs> <laughs> I spend a lot of time here. Okay, that's great. I, I just have one question on the final numbers. Um, so again, the nine percent increase is without the staff at SAD. Mm -hmm. um, so what is the total number and what is the total percentage with the? Uh, so adding in the staff mm -hmm. request, it brings the departmental increase to fourteen percent. And what's the dollar amount? 446000 But does that also, that takes the formerly capital items and adds that into the budget as that's, well? That's correct. Okay. Say that again? So the, yeah. the items that were in the past as part of our capital budget are now incorporated into your operating budget, mm -hmm. um, which you went through. I think the next page, right? Through the extraordinary uh, maintenance. The extraordinary budget. maintenance. The yes. extraordinary maintenance. Yeah. The capital yeah. items are still separate. But no, they're, but they're extraordinary used, used to be capital. Yeah. I had to take I had to take items out of capital that we were putting in capital for the last couple of years, and then take them back into the operating budget. And so what does that? Uh, thank you. Yeah. What does that amount to? Um, so the the increase was seventy seventy six thousand. And in terms of Ms. Rothmick, you know, just looking at the Muni report here and just looking at the total expenses and the grand total line items, can you just speak to the projection level? I'm sorry? Just the projection level and the total expenses and the grand total. So the total expenses speaks to 1.9 million and the grand total speaks to about 3.5 million. The Muni report. The grand total is 3.4 million. Okay, so that includes the projected. Um, no, so including the Munis only includes the existing staff. So including the um, re staff requests, it's 3.6 million. Okay, great, great. Okay, you know, we appreciate all the good work that you do. Thanks There's so much. A lot, Thank of work, Thanks. Work, lot of work for you in the upcoming year. <laughs> Thank Enjoy. you. Have a good night. I look forward to it. Did Mr. You Manning, did you have part? any questions? Sorry. Yeah. So did you add put these, this additional page? Is that accessible to us or could we get um, just to have? I think, yeah, we can probably share that with you. I don't, I, I, yeah, we I can don't have know why Georgette, it didn't go out um, in the A page must have package. been um, when it scanned through. Okay, great. Right. Yep. Yeah. We can have Georgette send that along. Thanks. Mr. Manning. Any questions for you? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming out tonight and presenting. All right. That was great. Uh, back on the agenda. Uh, reports, item B, superintendent's report, Dr. Kavanaugh. So I just have a few things for you tonight, a little bit of updated budget information. That's just a single slide. I have some information on enrollment projections, and some of this is things that you had seen last week when we talked a little bit about uh, the demographic study that Dr. Wagman had done, and then I just have a very brief update on my own goals. So we'll start with the budget update. Uh, 
Mrs. Rothmick and I took a look at where we were um, earlier today, and we, you know, go back to the fact that our budget message was uh, originally 5.5 percent, uh, and you know we know that there's some flexibility in that. When we are looking at sort of our uh, our non-negotiables, the things that are currently on the table that we have really no control over. So when we look at the block that says teacher costs, you know that those are their step raises. Mm -hmm. Colas and uh, lane changes, and that right now is at 1.7 million. Uh, we have other non-negotiables in there, which is 745,000. Those are the kinds of things that would be custodial um, raises, cafeteria worker raises, administrators raises, uh, increases to the bus contract, anything that's sort of contractual that you know there's really no wiggle room. So right now those numbers are at about two and a half million, which is 5.1 percent. And you know just so that to be clear, when we looked at personnel increases tonight, uh, you saw that there was a request for 60,000 in technology. 161,212 in facilities and 427,829 in special education. So, I, you know, I just put that out there so that we have a sense of where we are, you know, kind of numerically in terms of um, the budget message and, and, you know, where our current budget status is relevant, relative to the 5.5%. Big call out at the top uh, lets us know that this is really before we add, you know, sort of a single general education classroom teacher due to any of that enrollment growth. So, uh, off to enrollment projections. Uh, this is where we are. I think Georgette put this together for me a couple of days ago. Uh, the approved numbers for grades one to pre K, K to 12 are 270. Uh, we have seven approvals pending. We had 112 students exit the district. Our current enrollment as of today is 3,970. And that might be a little bit discrepant if you're looking at other numbers and places simply because we include Keefe Tech, Norfolk Aggie, um, anyone who is out at a charter school, and our 31 out of district students. And you can see that the pre-K number is at 83. I think one of the things that Mrs. DeBoe and Dr. Zaleski were getting at tonight, when that number in pre-K for special education hits 42, you have to create another classroom. Um, so we are in a place now where, you know, if you kind of do the math on that, uh, when you get to 84, you can see that you probably have like 42 students who are on IEPs and then they're matched typical peers, right? Yeah. Uh, this is an interesting slide, and this came about because some people uh, may be aware that last night the growth study um, group in town had put together a really fabulous presentation and had some really good attendance. Um, but prior to that, Chuck Joseph, who was the presenter last night, um, kept meeting this week sort of on an impromptu basis with uh, Susan Rothermick and me at the central office because we wanted to make sure that we really had our numbers sort of just right. The numbers that you see going across the top that keep increasing, 153, 168, 207, 228, those are the numbers of students from the Legacy Farms developments at each one of those intervals. So that 153, for example, was uh, the number that had enrolled uh, up to October of 2016. 168 was March of 2017, and they go in those increments because that's when Linda Henderson updates our SIMS data. So you can see that as of March 2019, we were really only at 342 students. Um, and then there's a huge jump to 441 students as of October of 2019. That's really a 99 student leap. And I think that as we have talked about the ratio of, you know, how many kids do we have in Legacy Farms, how many kids do we have throughout the rest of the, of the town, the percent used to be, um, well, the, the 
percent in growth, so maybe I ought to scoot down to the next box. Uh, so the gray that you see at the bottom is um, our overall increase that does not include legacy farms. So if you take the 3,452 students and you subtract the 3,331 that we began with in October of 2016, you'll see that we have 121 students increased from other areas in town. And that's been a big question for people. How many kids have come in from Legacy? How many kids have come in from other areas in, in the community? So if we looked at the 121 um, as our numerator over the 342 denominator, the new st the students coming from areas other than Legacy would have comprised about 35 percent of our new of our growth. Uh, that dropped to 27% when we had that 99 student increase going from March of 2019 to October of 2019. So I just thought those were kind of important numbers. Uh, overall, you can see that in that time period, we're talking about 409 net new students. I guess this is an important number from an overall town perspective to try and understand. Yes. But in terms of our schools, I would imagine the biggest impact of this is more on the transportation front. But in terms of education, we are looking at all the kids. Um, we are, and I think that the 409 net new students in that time period is a really important number because you know, it, it really doesn't matter where a student is coming from. At the end of the day, we need a lot of space to put these students in. We have transportation needs to ensure that kids are able to you know, get to school and, and back every day. So you know, the, one of the things that we talked a little bit about last night was that notion of thresholding, right? You can continue to absorb and absorb and absorb, and then one day you wake up and say, OK, we need some more classrooms. And I think we've reached that point. And I think actually what, we've, what we're hearing tonight, too, reveals that we also need support, support staff. It's not just, we always think classrooms and teachers, of course, but we also need custodians and administrators who can do all the paperwork to support all the students who are, you know, so I think the things that are less sort of sexy from an educational perspective are really important to keep us running in the midst of all this growth. Yes. We talk about teachers and classrooms because they're such big dollar items. But even as Mr. Ghosh was presenting tonight, you know, he would say this little bit of an increase comes just because we need more licenses. Right. I need more le Lexia licenses. I need more, you know, whatever kinds of licenses our kids are using. Unfortunately, it adds up. I mean, it's it does. little bits here and there, but it really does add up. Right. Exactly. Right, yeah, exactly. What is the 3452 on that slide? Those are the numbers of students currently in our district who are not legacy farm students. Gotcha. The 441 are the legacy farm students. Okay. Yeah, I would personally like to continue to focus on the overall student numbers um, and kind of keep that in mind. And I understand yes. this is needed for a different purpose. Right. Um, I think I'm just trying to illustrate that while there might be people who think that all of our growth is coming from legacy, that's absolutely not true. 121 students are coming from other places, which could be other new construction, but uh, my guess is a lot of those places are resale. Um, and another thing that I think is important for us to think about as we think about growth um, is that you know when a family moves in and buys a home, you know sometimes we look and we say, oh look, only one student came from that home. But that's today, right? So we don't know the number of preschool-aged children in those homes. So there, there's sort of that, that surprise that, that none of us can really put our finger on. Okay. Which is why I think this is another <laughs> important slide. This is, so when we've talked about the projections that Dr. Wagman has done for us, uh, we've thought a lot about um, residences, you know, how many kids have come from legacy farms, how many kids have come from resales, how many come from other new construction. But the other thing that I think we need to just sort of think about in terms of the calculations is what does cohort survival look like? So what he did for us here is he starts with 2009, 2010, and then he follows that class all the way you know, to the right through 2019, 2020. So if you follow along that arrow and you say in 2009, 2010, the entering kindergarten class had 198 kids in it. The following year, it went to 228, then it went to 234, then it went to 245, then it went to 255. And I know that people will say, 
you know, oh, some of those those increments are really small. So if you look at, at the next line over, the kids who were in first grade in 2009, 2010, their first leap is just a, an increase of nine students, then an increase of 14 students, and then an increase of seven, and then it stays the same, and then it's only two, and then it's only one, and then it's only one, and then it's only three. So there are teeny weeny little increments there. But by the time those 275 get all the way to the 11th grade, there are 327 of them. And so that's sort of the thing that I think we need to look at in that kind of long-term way is that cohort survival, it's rare for those cohorts to sort of drop off. So as we think about new growth, I don't think we can think just about the residencies and who's going to move in. I think we need to keep that algorithm of cohort survival alive. And I think that his work has tried to do both of those things for us. You know, NESDEC used to only do cohort survival, and that was a very weak means of taking a look at our growth. Is, is the cohort survival that was, is shown here, is this typical of most districts? Is it fairly consistent or is it representative of, of the quality that people are finding when they're here and they're staying? I think here, it, it's, it's different here because there are lots of places in Massachusetts where class sizes are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And here in Hopkinton, ours are getting larger and larger and larger. Some classes in small increments, some in much larger increments. Um, but I would also say that 2016, you'll see a big leap after the 2016. When you get to 2016, 17, the class sizes grow a, a lot more quickly. So while you look at the kindergarten starting classes at 198, 179, 192, there are still some that are in the 100s there. You know, as you look at um, that bottom line that shows 1920, it, it's, you don't see anything in the 100s there. And in fact, as you're looking at those numbers, I think our lowest one is 254 students, which is a far cry from where we used to be. Yeah. And that 254 grew by not 25-ish, a few more than 25 students from the previous year. Yes. So that, I mean, if it continues at that rate, they'll hit 300 pretty quick, too. Yes, they will. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I bring this one back. Uh, this one takes you out to the 2029-30 year. And you can see that that bottom row has some very high class sizes. Um, but the projected, projection of having classes over 400 um, may be very real. And again, I don't want to say that these numbers are carved in stone. I said last time that it's like catching smoke. We really don't know. Um, but these are the kinds of you know, sort of mathematical formulas that are used to make those projections. Dr. Kavno, as we hit some of these milestones, you know, 4,000, 4,500, mm -hmm. are there any, um, uh, you know, mandated positions or anything that we may have to do additionally in our district? No, in terms of mandates, you know, there will always be special education. So as <coughs> we talked about when Dr. Zaleski was presenting her budget tonight, um, right now our district is about 12.5% special education students. So, you know, as you increase your overall numbers, you'll increase the numbers of students with special needs. And we may include uh, increase, you know, some L students along the way. You know, we may not in in increase our L students along the way. Um, but I guess I would just like, and, and this again goes back to our December 5th meeting, I really think it's important for people to come and see these numbers. But we do have the gift of a few years to see if our numbers are playing out the way they are predicted to or if they don't. And so as we, you know, right now we've got the plan to put four modulars at Hopkins, four modulars at Elmwood, and, you know, we're looking at where do we need new construction in our district, how much will MSBA be willing to um, fund and how much will they not based on their, you know, presumptions about our enrollment. So I just feel like these are all really important discussions to continue to have. And the, the pre-K numbers seem to be low. Are we thinking that we're going to, lower than like today? Or are we near the 80s now? What, yeah, what we saw on the previous slide is that we were at 82. Uh, so and I think that because of, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. 
Yeah, and again, that, that will really sort of fluctuate with how many students do we have. The, the reason we know we have to go to an additional classroom next year is that um, our early intervention kids are indicating that we will be over 42 in terms of the number of students with special needs. I just would assume that these they may be low. Stay, yeah. yeah, stay closer to 80 mm -hmm. for yeah. absolutely. Yeah, especially the uh, you know I think Amanda you had talked about it last time too from uh, the 21 22 that growth number mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. knowing what we have still um, mm -hmm. what that's going on in the town right. And just a very quick update on my own goals. Um, you know, my first goal was to conduct an analysis of our school facilities and develop a capital budget reflective of our perceived needs. Just a couple things there that I've highlighted that I think are very important. Uh, we will have four articles on the special town meeting warrant on December 9th, and those are for the classrooms at Elmwood, Hopkins, and the high school. Uh, and the fourth one is just to do the uh, engineering design study. And the other highlighted area is when we do our um, public hearing on December 5th, prior to the public hearing, the White House is going to be open to do their open house. So we thought we might be able to do everything in one day, which might attract more people if they have a purpose to be here in the evening. And I believe that there will be um, refreshments provided by the students who occupy the White House. So, so is that yes. going to go from 4 until 1? 4 to 5.30. And then people can head over here for the um, public hearing. It will be a that's busy great. day. It will be a busy, wonderful day. Yeah, that's great. great. Um, and if you get the um, Dr. Zaleski's newsletter, there's also a flyer in there linked so that you'll be able to see how the invitation itself looks. Super. Um, just a couple other things. Continuing to monitor student enrollment like crazy. Uh, working with the Director of Finance, Building and Grounds, and an architectural firm to take a look at the cost associated with new classrooms. I think we've taken care of that. And then just during the budget process, presenting a capital plan that's going to reflect our, our physical plants. I am hoping that folks will come out on December 5th. And tomorrow morning, I'll be going to um, HCAM early in the morning to do some uh, public service announcements on that so that we have a community that's aware of the December 5th date. Um, the second goal, um, just sort of the, the whole issue around um, equity and inclusion and diversity, and I am pleased to let you know that on the December 12th agenda, the calendar subcommittee will be presenting to you its recommended revised calendar. So that's good. Uh, goal number three, just keeping up with uh, the superintendent's blog, uh, using email as a medium for school business. And I will say that I think in some ways sending out information to families may be getting some traction. And I don't know if it's just because it's a rough budget year or what, but we have been getting a few visitors to our meetings, which is really exciting because mm -hmm. we used to be here by ourselves. <laughs> I, I, do, I do want to say that, um, you know, your blog, I shared this with you, it's appreciated in the community. Oh, thank you. Uh, I have had folks come up and say they really um, enjoy it. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah, as are I, your emails yeah. that say, you know, this is what the school committee is going to talk about, as opposed to saying check the agenda. Boom, boom, boom. Here's what they're going to talk about tonight. It's quick, yes. easy to understand, read. You've gotten good feedback about that, too. I put out the juicier items. Yes, too. yes, you do. You do a good job for that. <laughs> as well as the HCAM little updates oh, yeah. that you're doing. I have heard a lot of people are watching those and that that's they're good. well received. So. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, and uh, just very clear messaging, I think. At these meetings with the admin team on Tuesday, we had an administrative team meeting. It was really just the five principals, Dr. Zaleski, Mrs. Rothermick, and I. And you know, we really went through the budget K-12 because it's really important for each one of the principals to have a respect and understanding for what everyone is asking for because we're all just one piece of the puzzle. Um, and then, you know, that helps to be able to, you know, if I am Mr. Keller in the middle school, I could speak to what, you know, Mrs. Carver is asking for at Elmwood so that there's a really nice understanding among principals mm -hmm. and among families. Uh, and obviously the, the HCAM stuff. And then finally, um, innovative learning. Uh, we have our STEAM coordinator in place. As Mr. Ghosh was talking about tonight, the FUSE Fellowship Program is underway, um, looking very good. We um, 
have the consultant working at Marathon right now, taking a look at what does um, specialized instruction delivery look like. And so really kind of getting down to that nitty gritty of, you know, really hitting kids' needs in terms of special education instruction. Um, the assistant superintendent and I brought in a, a presenter to do guided inquiry. She was just here for the last three days, and it was a really funny phenomenon, I think, because teachers were like, oh, being out of the classroom for three days, it's an awfully long time. And when uh, Jen Parson did her feedback survey today, uh, some of the teachers said it was so great, but there was just not enough time. So, so I mean, if you could have somebody like that come for a long time, it would be wonderful, but finding the subs is, is just way too difficult. Um, May and I ask a follow-up question on the guided inquiry? Sure, go I'm, ahead. I'm very interested in that a little bit. And, uh, you know, in terms of the rollout, can you share? Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. So there were seven teams. They came from uh, Hopkins, the middle school, and the high school. And really the goal of that work is to take some topic that they either will teach or are already teaching and then just really thinking about how to pique kids' curiosity, how to help them drive their own questioning, kind of conduct their own research. And it's, you know, it sounds... It, I think to some people when they hear that, it sounds to them like, well, that feels kind of open and loosey-goosey. But you'd, if you were part of the training, you would see that every one of the standards that as part of that unit would have been hit in the process of that. You know, you start with this sort of immersion thing where you really get kids so that they have a pretty good understanding of the topic before they get into the exploration phase. So, uh, And then the last part is um, just to work with the assistant superintendent, secondary principals to do all kinds of social, emotional learning and behavioral programs, keeping student voice and choice alive, the grant-funded CVTE options and, and that sort of thing. And you know that we always have social-emotional learning going on. And I'm a little bit sorry in the way I worded that goal because I really feel like I should have included Dr. Zaleski as well. The work that she does with the principals in social-emotional is amazing. Um, a full disclosure, one of the things that I think they would have liked was a K-12 social-emotional coordinator. And I said, not while Karen Zaleski is in my district because <laughs> she She's doing, I think she's doing that work herself. So, uh, These are just some of the pictures of the guided inquiry work. You can see how many teachers we had in that room. It was, I mean, there was an enormous number of teachers, well over 40. Um, and there's already sort of a clamoring to train a, another 40, 45 teachers for next Great. year. Um, the, the work that they put together, if you saw the, the units of study were amazing and I even think that honestly the consultant who um, I had known uh, from seeing her work in another district uh, said that she was stunned at what our people could do and I guess this might be a really nice time to talk about that a little bit um, when I first came to Hopkinton and Mr. Bishop said no no we run two different schedules there's a fall one and a spring one at the high school and I thought oh my gosh what an enormous amount of work that is. Why? Why would you ever do that? And how do you know that what the kids get in semester one is consistent so that if kids from this class, this class, and this class all move into one in the second semester, that they're all going to have the same knowledge base. And it's because he has established those course partnerships. If you all teach the same course, you meet together, you talk about the curriculum, the instruction, the assessment, student work, you really dissect all of that. And it has raised the level of teaching and learning um, at the high school in the same way that teamwork and PLCs the professional learning communities have in other buildings um, throughout the district. So I, I have started to think of this as sort of the secret sauce of Hopkinton. Like this is really why the level of instruction is so amazing because I think our teachers work as like little families. If you saw some of them working together, like there's a couple of people that I was picking on this morning a little bit saying, you guys are like brother and sister, you fight about this all day long. But it's because of that argumentation that the instruction just keeps getting better and better. Um, and I told them this morning this would really be part of my sort of Thanksgiving message to the teachers is that that community, that sense of community in grade levels and in buildings is, it's, it's you know, unsurpassable. I don't think I've ever seen that in any other district. 
and a little Pirates of Penzance. I saw that this afternoon before arriving here today. So if you have some free time this weekend and you want to get out and see the fall musical, um, I would say don't miss it. It was it was pretty exceptional. Um, the voices, the kids are amazing. The the singing is outstanding. And then finally. Uh, <laughs> This is a little bit funny. So when I went to Hopkins today, they're having their competition, grade four versus grade five, bringing in Thanksgiving <laughs> food. Uh, but you can see how all of that is stacked. Uh, one of the custodians who is, you know, we call him the savant custodian. <laughs> uh, had the, all that food was all over one table one night, and he went in and sort of stacked it all up and made it look really fabulous for the kids. And now they come in, and they see how to restack <laughs> it Excellent. and make it look pretty Fantastic. special. So. And that's all I <laughs> the have. Grade four or five on the, the left. Fourth grade is very proud of their current Fourth grade in is the competition. Yes. <laughs> Clear winners in the fourth grade. So. Yep. There's a yep. lot of trash talking going on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's great. Excellent. That's all I have. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? No. This is great. Thank you. Thanks great. so much. Um, we'll move on to the chair, but it looks, I thought I signed something. Maybe I did not uh, in my chair report. That you did that. I'm sorry. I thought I signed some warrants, but maybe not. Oh, maybe no, I'm no. imagining. Oh. Uh, because it's not in. Oh, maybe if you signed them just this week, they. Yeah, on, on Tuesday. Uh, but maybe they'll bring those back for the next meeting. If the packet was probably put together on Friday. That's right. Right, right. That's, right. right. that's correct. That's yes. Right. Yeah. right. So I do have a few updates on, on my end. Uh, there was, uh, as we know, a parent had uh, requested and uh, wanted to know a little bit about the transportation policy. Uh, we met as a policy working group and I was able to update the policy working group's message that we should have, um, we should be able to relook at it in spring, uh, late winter, spring time frame. That was an update. Um, also, uh, Dr. Kavanaugh and I spoke with a member of the community who made a facility naming request um, and uh, we spoke uh, to the member about the testimonials provided so far and the member has decided not to pursue the request any further at this point. Um, over the weekend, I also had an opportunity to speak with Senate President Spilka uh, about the, some of the issues that are going on, especially around growth and the build out and very thankful for their support in terms of the work at Elmwood. Um, I also talked a little bit about, uh, you know, there are all these needs coming up. She shared, uh, which I told her I'll bring back to the school committee, she said that when she was on the school committee, um, she worked to make it possible for the school facilities to become more accessible to town members, to bring them in, uh, and those, especially those who don't have school-going children. That may be something for us to think about. I know we have a policy in place, but perhaps we can look to see if there's more of an opportunity that these facilities are everyone's, not just, uh, you know, it belongs to the entire community. Um, in addition to that, I have reached out to Representative Dykema's office as well as Senate President's office to join the public forum. Um, I do have confirmation from Ms. Susan Nicole, who will be represented in oh, the nice. uh, Senate President's office. Uh, I'm wondering if we should even invite them to the White House uh, opening oh, ceremony. Nice, yeah. uh, I don't know if they will have that much time to stay around for that long, but perhaps we could do that. And because it's kind of an open house, they could just zip in and zip out. Oh, that's okay. that's great. Um, I could not attend the last select board meeting, uh, but I did catch it uh, on tape on HCAM, thanks to HCAM. Um, and one of the things that uh, you know I wanted to bring back for the community was that Mr. Herb pointed to the fact that some of the debt undertaken is coming off the books, and we likely have some capability to undertake new projects. I thought that was exciting news. Um, and the timelines, uh, I think that was one thing that was uh, seemed a little open-ended, but perhaps something for us to follow up on. Um, with regard to the funds being sought at the um, special town meeting, 
it didn't seem like that was very clear in that conversation. Again, I caught it only on tape. I haven't had a chance to follow up. We don't have a date penciled in as yet on the budget advisory group, hopefully soon. Uh, but we're planning to go tomorrow morning. There's a very short meeting uh, to look at the warrant article, so maybe we'll find uh, a date. Uh, also, Dr. Kavanaugh had shared the warrant articles after reviewing it with the school's attorney and Ms. Rothamick, and I provided uh, some feedback, as it made sense to me, on behalf of the school committee. Um, I also thought uh, the growth study committee public forum was great mm -hmm. last night. Yes. Um, I think it gave an opportunity to look at data together as a community and listen to questions and concerns on everyone's minds. Um, for me personally, you know, I, I continue to harp on this that we need to look at growth as an opportunity. Uh, this is really an opportunity to be better. We any we have to invest, we just need to figure out how we can put it in a direction that helps us continue uh, at the levels we have been. Um, also, um, you know, I'm just going a little bit into the liaison role here for me. The Marathon Fund Committee met with the CFO and town manager on the low funding this year, which I had mentioned to all of you earlier. It seems the expenses have been going up while the funds haven't increased proportionately. So we'll have to work with what is available was the message this year. That's all I have for my updates. Um, if there are any other liaison reports, you know, they've met fairly quickly this time round. I was just wondering. I have a couple quick ones. Two, you, you've basically touched on the policy and the um, growth study committee and the public forum. So that though, there have been several meetings over the last few weeks culminating in the forum, which was great. But the work isn't done now. We're compiling the results of the discussion, or we, they. I'm going to kind of watch it happen and contribute where I can. But they um, are going to continue to meet. And, and I think the plan is to kind of keep looking at this and, and churning away at and finding more data and what the community is interested in seeing. So um, some more to come on that. Um, one other thing, the elementary school building committee, Marathon School, is still at it and we're still, but what I, the reason why I want to bring it up is because um, Mike Shepard, he is just, he is adamant that there are no open orders of conditions on this particular project. So thank goodness for Mike Shepard. He has been diligent about making sure that all of the, you know, the, the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted and he is, um, he's very passionate about making sure that this does not become something that we are, you know, including in our budget 15, 20, 25 years later, um, which we found ourselves in a position to do that this year. So anyway, um, there are some, still a few, a few things that need to be taken care of before the project can be closed out. Um, so anyway, I just, he's, he's been fantastic, um, as has Tim and Susan, because they've had to put a lot of these things into place as Mike is sort of churning things through. So anyway, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and, you know, you already mentioned policy, and, and so we're... But you could pitching. provide an update on, you know, some of the other items we looked at. Well, I mean, we're, we th we have not had policy, I guess, on the agenda now in a couple of meetings. So I guess for whatever it's worth, the, the things that we brought forth this, this fall will come back. It's just that we, we didn't want it. We know the budget is such a pressing, you know, we're already an hour up, well, you know, past what we thought we were going to be. Um, so w we will bring them back eventually, so they're not... You know, they're not just hanging out there. We haven't forgotten them. They'll come back. I do think uh, that the work on the growth study committee is commendable, and I'm I'm so glad you're on it. Thank you. It's and been being a voice for very, the enlightening. Committee, uh, very enlightening. Very enlightening through the process. Thank you. I I don't know what others thought. I know some of us also attended um, the growth study committee, and you know, we are all in it together, right? It's the town, it's the schools. There was a lot of data presented. I thought it was great, and I enjoyed the conversation that we had in the smaller group as well. So. I thought it was great too, and I think for anyone out there, the um, presentation has now been posted on HCAM, mm -hmm. and I'm, there's so much good data in about 10 or 15 minutes up front that um, really set a nice level understanding of um, where we are and where we've been. There's a lot of institutional knowledge with Chuck Joseph and a lot of the members of the committee who, you know, who lived through building this building. 
you right. know, when that happened and um, have lived through growth spurts in town and have applied that historical knowledge to today. And so I found all that very interesting. And I think the um, foundational slides were very informative. So I would encourage people to check it out. Thanks to HCAM. <laughs> So, I, I, would, I don't want to take away if somebody else wanted to say something about the forum, but I had another um, yeah, on. Please do. So just to update people on the, some of the work the bridge is doing, we're looking at kind of shifting seasons and the needs that we're hearing from the schools, the elementary schools looking for kids that come to school with no coats, that don't have uh, snow pants and boots, and matching them with community people to be able to, to help with some of that uh, and working with Project Just Because, who is been supportive of a lot of the different needs our kids have, things like earbuds in the high school, um, snacks in the schools and stuff like that. So we are continuing that in looking to kind of bring the next layer of, there because there are a lot of different community organizations out there right now that are looking to provide um, for families and students in Hopkinton and looking to kind of bring people on the same page. So that's, that's great. That's great. Thank you, Nancy. That's important work. I've got um, two updates. Oh, sorry. That's all right. Please. <laughs> um, Youth Commission is just rocking. They are so great. They're, they're doing wonderful things. They um, are putting together a gift card drive. So even if you only want to buy a $5 gift card, you can deposit them in these drop boxes at the police station, the high school, at the library, and the Youth and Family Services will then distribute those to kids and groups who need them. So you have the opportunity to, to drop them off between Thanksgiving and February. Uh, Youth Commission is also thrilled to collaborate again with the Education Station to offer incredibly reduced pricing for Hopkinton 11th grade students for ACT and SAT test prep. In fact, I think it's less than a quarter of the price, of the standard price. Um, education Station will do a free baseline of both tests with an analysis of the result for any student to determine which test they should focus on. So thanks so much to Christine Chapman of the Education Station for working with the Youth Commission. Um, CPAC, I think one thing that they have done, which we, we did not do before in CPAC, which is very clever, is to offer this remote access to the meetings which I've used three times now. <laughs> but it really helps if you have kids with special needs at home. It's, it's often not easy to get out in the evening to come. So I think th this has been a boon to the community. Um, they're also working on developing a number of workshops for the rest of the year. One called Taking Control of Your Future. I guess we should all go to that. That will address <laughs> transition services. Um, but they're doing a great job as well. That's fabulous. Good work all around. Thank you. Uh, all right. I don't know. I feel we are early, even though we're late. Uh, it feels early to you. It does. Gonna, I was just going to say the exact same thing. <laughs> it's only time nine. flies when you're having fun, huh? I guess. I think you're still on Southeast Asian time. <laughs> <laughs> it's tomorrow already in Mina's world. <laughs> That's it's true. Right. It's very early in the morning there. I probably wouldn't have woken up by then. <laughs> Okay, um, on to public comments. Anyone here? Nope. Do we need to do the solar battery? Yep. Yep. All right. Seeing none, moving on to, we don't have any items by consensus. With the, sol either. the new business, yes. solar the solar battery, battery storage. Oh. Thank you. Sorry. That was, like, coming thank down you. the you table. Didn't that was, kick nope, me. Thank you. That's because I'll be louder next time. We're <laughs> kicking and I'll kick her. Mina. Thank you. Okay, new business, solar battery storage for Marathon School. Ms. Rodman. Thank you. Um, so, as you can see from the memo, um, we came to you last year in terms of putting solar um, installation on the Marathon School. So that is almost at uh, completion. And one of the things that we continue to do, um, Tim Person and I, is constantly look at utilities and what can be done to bring down our utility costs. Um, so one of the things that we're looking at now is a battery storage component to the um, um, solar installation. And basically what that does, the, the battery will store the energy that is produced through the solar system, but then using software it will be released into the grid at the optimum time 
Um, if you've ever really paid attention to your electricity bills, depending on the time of day, you're charged different rates. Um, peak charges really make up the majority of your utility bill. So this allows the energy to be released at the optimum times to reduce basically our usage during that those peak times. Um, as you know, schools can't fluctuate in terms of their hours or the days that they operate. So we don't have that ability. Um, the other thing that uh, places can do is you can uh, do what's called offloading. So if you know when the utility is exactly going to come in and look at your demand and your peak, um, what some places are able to do is what's called offloading. In other words, they shut down as many systems as possible and go, you know, uh, so that they bring down their reduction so the utility sees them at a, at a lower um, use, and that's their capacity tag. So these are the things that the software within the battery allow us to um, be much more nimble in terms <laughs> of managing um, our, our time of use. To give you an idea, um, this is the last utility bill that we received um, for Marathon. So the month um, invoice is $6,200 for the month. The first piece of that is your supply. Now keep in mind, we go out and we do competitive supply. So we have a contract that gets the best price on our supply generation. So that piece is, is um, as best as we can. That's $3,000 of that $6,000. Your demand and peak is 2800 and your off-peak is $383. So to give you an idea, it's that demand peak that we're trying to manage, and that's what the battery storage piece to the solar installation allows us to start getting at. Yeah. Seems like that should just be part of the beginning process. I mean, that's the whole point of solar, right, is to try to bring down. So I know I, this makes great sense, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's what um, the, the DOER, or I mean, the, the, this is what they're looking for now with green energy installations. They're looking for that storage component to be part of the system go, going Moving forward, forward now. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, that makes sense. Before it was just all about green energy, but now it's about managing the grid. Okay. Right. Okay. Are there any other districts that have storage capacity in Massachusetts? There are a lot of school systems that, that are moving this direction, and, the, and there's battery storage everywhere are there any thoughts on how at what point the cost of this would sort of start to begin to offset itself is that something too abstract to project out what do you mean like for example if it was around twenty eight hundred dollars of peak usage right mm -hmm. so say we reduce say we cut it in half mm -hmm. you know and we save essentially fourteen hundred dollars a month so what would be the point Roughly, because there's no numbers on this, I don't think, right? So is there where we would sort of recoup our investment in the storage? Well, we don't pay. It's free. So it, it's the installation is free? It's free. Yeah. So it's similar to the installation of the solar with a power purchase agreement where they upfront the capital. Okay. And then we share in the savings. It's the, it's the same idea. The company upfronts the capital for the battery installation, and then we save, we share in the savings. All right. So the contract is basically with someone, but it's a, it's a, it's free. It's free. That's oh. correct. So the estimate was, I think, one hundred and twenty thousand dollars over the twenty-year lifespan of our agreement with the solar. So it's about six thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the concerns that I had raised were around safety, um, just because there are some. I don't know anything about it. I mean, I'm not an industry person here, so I'm just a citizen with a little smidge of awareness. So um, there is some concern about the safety of lithium-ion storage. It's, sure. I mean, there are concerns. I think it's in New York that they're, they're pushing to have municipal policies on how and both residential and commercial and municipal installs look and whatnot. I mean, there's, this, there's the, the, the concerns are fire and toxic gases, as I understand it. Um, it is a sp small percentage of a concern, 
but there is still a concern. And the technology is kind of moving as fast, if not faster, as I understand it, than municipalities are in, are preparing to deal with it. So my question was, what did we hear from Chief Slayman on his opinion of this? And because I know I'm looking at a Fire and Life Safety Policy Institute one pager on that's come from this year on what municipalities should do. I haven't heard any buzz in, in Hopkinton about this, but it's a little bit of a low yield per year at only six thousand dollars. If there's a risk, I want to make sure that we're comfortable because it's not that much. It's savings, but it's not that much savings. So I didn't know if, if we had a report back. So th they've been working with Chief Slayman, and they will continue to work with him in terms of the install, the location, and, you know, it, having his comfort. It'll all go through the proper permitting. So I don't think anybody's going to permit something that they're not comfortable with. Well, it's, I, I totally, of course, that's true. We have excellent professionals, but I think we don't know what we don't know. And this is a technology where I feel like we don't really know what we don't know. So I had some concerns about that. I don't know timing wise when we have, like, is there, is this um, offer to us to get this sort of available for a certain time window? Or could we, could we think about this a little bit? Or it's it, to, in order to, the business model would be to do it now with the, with the, the same life as the solar panels now this year but not now today like it could maybe wait another meeting if necessary um waiting another meeting you know just if anyone else had any concerns i don't know we don't get to talk outside of open meeting so i didn't know if anyone had any um concerns or thoughts this is the first i've heard and thank you for bringing it up thank amanda you. i, I had so no much. idea okay, uh, it's a small it's a small risk i mean there was a a big fire in Arizona, which was not our kind of install, apparently. But there are a lot of things that people don't know. And there's just a lot of, it seems like there's a fair amount of literature that says, you know, this is here. It's a reality. Lithium ion is the most efficient way to store the, the energy. There are other technologies that are not as good. But there are concerns. And the fires are difficult because it's a mix of chemicals and electricity. And, you know, it's, there's a, there is a small concern. So I just want to make sure that we know what we're getting into. Yeah, and like I said, I mean, they've been discussing this with Chief Slayman for quite some time. So. Yeah, I mean, if we want to give folks, a t you know, some time to think about it in the community, you know, like you said, it's new technology. I hear, I, you know, we absolutely trust the work that you do just from a process standpoint, giving folks an opportunity. We have clearly not highlighted. I mean, I skipped it and went to public comment. Uh, <laughs> so perhaps give uh, folks a little opportunity to know. And you know, if anyone has any questions, bring those back and we address it. And perhaps at the next meeting, we could make the motion. Does that sound OK to you, Ms. Rathmik? It's, it's up to the committee. Maybe if we could hear from Chief Slayman just to, to hear if he has any residual concerns or um, you know what he's hearing again I think this is um, probably big in his in his field I think this is you know homes with solar installs are looking to do the same thing this is a thing that's happening so mm -hmm. I think towns are looking to get on top of this so I'm just curious where he's at and where our, our department is at and I'm sure there's been some training and just to kind of get a community update on that would be helpful what does everyone else think if we have, you know, if this is not, doesn't have a deadline, specific deadline to, of tonight, I mean, like you said, I think, it, I'm inclined if he's already been on board with the committee and we had a specific deadline, I would be inclined to vote it. But if we could get more input specific from the chief just to assuage your, your concerns and, or, or even you know, you could look. I yeah, mean, I, exactly. I think that us. that's, I mean, a, if you want to take a vote, it's fine. I can, no, vote. I think it's fair though, because it is. I mean, I, I mean, lithium ion is, you know, Stuff happens, so you want to know that we're prepared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, perhaps we'll bring it back to at the next meeting. Mm -hmm. I'll make a note for Georgia. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for bringing it, it forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so am I on track now? You have to tell me. Just need an adjournment. <laughs> uh, are we almost there? <laughs> Just give me one minute.
I don't okay. think there are any items by consensus. So there, there aren't any items by consensus. Um, oh I just wanted to say that um, there are two things it looks like that are coming up. One next week is the top of the hill, uh, which I hope some of us can go. I'm mm -hmm. certainly planning on going. It's on Tuesday evening. I, th I think that'll be a good one. And I think, Dr. Kavner, you spoke about uh, the musical the high school at the high school this weekend, this weekend. Yes. so perhaps if you're able to go I think that might be another uh, interesting thing to go to um, and I just want to say uh, you know I sent a note to my colleagues I'm very very thankful uh, to be working with all of you here just reflecting uh, as we are heading into the Thanksgiving week uh, very thankful for this community you know, uh, AAA rated, safest town to live in, best community to be in, best schools. Um, I'm not a big fan of the numbers. Um, you know, the one, two, three, I don't think they mean much in my view. All that they are indicative of is that something great going on in our community. And I think um, all of us work towards it, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, so with that, I wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving. Same to you. Thank you, Mina. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now I would seek a motion for adjournment. I so move that we adjourn. Motion by Second. Meg. Second by Nancy. All those in favor? Aye, aye, aye. Yes, as well. And we are adjourned. And our next meeting will be on December 5th at 6 p.m. We will have a public hearing as well as our regular meeting at the high school auditorium. We still have to figure out the configuration of how the school committee will be seated at the auditorium with the help of HCAM, um, and followed by uh, the special town meeting on December 9th, and again on December 12th, we'll have a regular meeting. Thank you. Thank have a lovely you. night. Thank you.